Preface to Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott. Preface. There is a sort of fate about writing books of travel which it is impossible to escape. It is vain to declare that no inducement will bribe one to do it, that there is nothing new to tell, and that nobody wants to read the worn-out story. Sooner or later the deed is done, and not till the book is safely shelved does peace descend upon the victim of this mysterious doom. The only way in which this affliction may be lightened to a long-suffering public is to make the work as cheerful and as short as possible. With this hope the undersigned bore has abstained from giving the dimensions of any church, the population of any city, or description of famous places, as far as in her lay, but confined herself to the personal haps and mishaps, adventures and experiences of her wanderers. To explain the undue prominence given to Miss Lavinia, it should be stated that she is an old and intimate friend of the compiler of this frivolous work, and therefore her views on all subjects, though less valuable, were easier to obtain than those of the younger and more interesting shawl strappists. L. M. A. November 1872 End of Preface Chapter One of Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. By Louisa May Alcott. Chapter One Off. On the first day of February we three will sail from Boston for Messina in the little fruit ship Wasp. We shall probably be a month going unless we cross in a gale as I did, splitting sails every night, and standing on our heads most of the way, said Amanda, folding up her maps with an air of calm decision. Hurrah! What fun! cried Matilda, waving a half-finished dressing-case over her head. But Lavinia, with one sepulchral groan, fell flat upon her bed and lay there, dumb with the horrors of such a voyage. "'Just the thing for you, my poor old dear. Think of the balmy airs of Sicily, the oranges, the flowers. Then a delicious month or two at Sorrento, with no east winds, no slush, no spring cleaning. We shall be as merry as grigs and get as buxom as dairy maids in a month,' said the sprightly Amanda." You promised to go, and if you back out we are lost, for we must have a duenna. You can lie around in Europe just as well as here, and I have no doubt it will do you a world of good, added Matilda. I shall keep my word, but you will bury me in the Atlantic, so make up your minds to it. Do you suppose that I, a poor used-up old invalid who can't look at a sailboat without a qualm, can survive thirty days of standing on my head and thirty nights of sail-splitting as we go slamming and lurching across two or three awful oceans demanded lavinia with the energy of despair before any one could reply amanda's little mercury appeared with a note the wasp will not take passengers and no other fruit ship sails this spring read amanda oh dear sighed matilda saved cried lavinia be calm, we shall go sooner or later, if I buy a ship and sail her myself. With which indomitable remark Amanda went forth to grapple with and conquer untoward circumstances. A month of plans, vicissitudes, and suspense followed, during which Amanda strove manfully, Matilda suffered agonies of hope and fear, and Lavinia remained a passive shuttlecock, waiting to be tossed wherever fate's battle door chose to send her. Exactly two weeks from today we sail with a party of friends in the French steamer Lafayette from New York for Brest. Will you be ready? demanded Amanda, after a protracted wrestle with aforesaid adverse circumstances. But that is exactly what we didn't mean to do. It's expensive and fashionable, France and not Italy, North and not South. That's because I'm in the party. If you take a Jonah, nothing will go well. Leave me behind and you will have a charming trip 
said Lavinia, who had an oyster-like objection to being torn from her bed. "'No matter. We are going. Live or die, sink or swim, and I shall expect to meet you, all booted and spurred and fit for the fight, April first, said the unwavering Amanda. "'A most appropriate day for three lone women to start off on a wild goose chase after health and pleasure,' groaned Lavinia from among her pillows. "'Very well, then. I leave you now, and shall expect to meet on the appointed day?' "'If I'm spared,' answered the sufferer. "'I'll bring her, never fear,' added the sanguine Matt, as she rattled the trays out of an immense trunk. How they ever did it no one knows, but in a week everything was ready, and the sisters had nothing left to do but sit and receive the presents that showered upon them from all quarters. How kind everyone was, to be sure! Six fine dressing cases arrived, and were hung upon the walls, four smelling bottles, one for each nostril, bed socks, rigolettes, afghans, lunch baskets, pocket flasks, guide books, needle cases, bouquets and stacks, and a great cake with their names on top, in red and blue letters three inches long. Friendly fingers sewed for them, even the gentlemen of the house, and there were eight, had a bee, and hemmed handkerchiefs for a mat, marked towels, and one noble being actually took off his coat and packed the trunks in layers of mosaic work wonderful to behold. A supper celebrated the last evening, and even the doleful Lavinia, touched by such kindness, emerged from her slew of despond and electrified the ball by dancing a jig with great spirit and grace. Devoted beings were up at dawn to share the early breakfast, lug trunks, fly up and down with last messages, cheer heartily as the carriage drove off, and then adjourn en masse to the station, there to shake hands all round once more and wave and wring handkerchiefs as the train at last bore the jocund Matt and the resigned Lavinia towards the trysting place and Amanda. All along the route more friends kept bursting into the cars as they stopped at different places, more gifts, more handshakes and kisses, more good wishes and kind prophecies, till at last in a chaos of smiles, tears, smelling bottles, luncheon, cloaks, boots, and foot warmers, the travellers left the last friendly face behind and steamed away to New York. "'How delicious this is!' cried the untravelled Matilda, as they stepped upon the deck of the Lafayette, and she sniffed the shippy fragrance that caused Lavinia to gasp and answer darkly, "'Wait till to-morrow.' While Matt surveyed the steamer under the care of devoted being number ten, who appeared to see them off, Lavinia arranged the stateroom, stowing away all useless gear and laying forth dressing-gowns, slippers, pocket-handkerchiefs, with an anguished smile. She had crossed the ocean twice, and was a wiser, sadder woman for it. At eight she turned in, and ten minutes later Amanda came aboard with a flock of gay friends. But no temptations of the flesh could lure the wary spinster from her den, for the night was rough and cold, and the steamer a babble of confusion. "'It's perfectly delightful. I wish you'd been there, Livy. "'We had supper, and songs, and funny stories, and, and all sorts of larks. "'There are quantities of nice people aboard, and we shall have a perfectly splendid trip. "'I shall be up bright and early, put on my scarlet stockings, my new boots, and pretty sea-suit, "'and go in for a jolly day,' said the ardent Matilda, "'as she came skipping down at midnight and fell asleep, "'full of rosy visions of the joys of a life on the ocean wave.' "'Deluded child!' sighed Lavinia, closing her dizzy eyes upon the swaying garments on the wall, and feebly wishing she had hung herself along with them. In the grey dawn she was awakened by sounds of woe, and peering forth beheld the festive Matilda with one red stocking and one off, her blonde locks wildly dishevelled, her face of a pale green, and her hands clasping lemons, cologne, and salts, as she lay with her brow upon the cool marble of the toilet-table. "'How do you like it, dear?' asked the unfeeling Lavinia. "'Oh, what is it? I feel as if I was dying. "'If somebody would only stop the swing one minute. "'Is it seasickness? It's awful, but it will do me good. "'Oh, yes, I hope so. I've tried everything, and I feel worse and worse. "'Hold me, save me. Oh, I wish I hadn't come.' "'Shipmates, ahoy! How are you, my loves?' Aunt Amanda appeared, "'rosy, calm, and gay, with her pea-jacket on, skirts close-reefed, hat well to windward.' and everything taut and shipshape, for she was a fine sailor and never missed a meal. Wales greeted her and faint inquiries as to the state of things in the upper world. Blowing a gale, rain, hail, and snow, very dirty weather, and we are flying off the coast in fine style, was the cheerful reply. 
"'Have we split any sails?' asked Lavinia, not daring to open her eyes. "'Dozens, I dare say. Shipping seas every five minutes. All the passengers ill but me, and every prospect of a northeaster all the way over,' continued the lively Amanda, lurching briskly about the passage with her hands in her pockets. Matilda dropped her lemons in her bottles to wring her hands, and Lavinia softly murmured, "'Lord, what fools we mortals be, that we ever go to sea!' breakfast ladies cried the pretty french stewardess prancing in with teacups bowls of gruel and piles of toast balanced in some miraculous manner all over her arms oh take it away i shall never eat again moaned matilda clinging frantically to the marble as the water pitcher went down the middle with a hairbrush and all the boots and shoes had a grand promenade round the room don't speak to me don't look at me don't even think of me for three days at least go and enjoy yourself and leave us to our doom with which tragical remark lavinia drew her curtains and was seen no more great heavens what a week that was rain wind fog creak pitch toss noise smells cold broken sleep by day woe in every variety by night food and drink a delusion and a snare society an affliction life a burden death a far-off blessing not to be had at any price slowly slowly the victims emerge from the lower depths of gloom feebly smile faintly joke pick fearfully but wistfully at once rejected dishes talk about getting up but don't do it read a little look at their sallow countenances and hand-glasses and speculate upon the good effects of travel upon the constitution then they suddenly become daring, gay, and social, rise, adorn themselves, pervade the cabins, sniff the odors of engine and chicken without qualms, play games, go to table, and, just as the voyage is over, begin to enjoy it. Alas for poor Lavinia! No such resurrection was possible for her. Long after Matt had bravely donned the scarlet hose, cocked up her beaver, and gone forth to festive scenes, her shipmate remained below in chrysalis state, fed by faithful Marie, visited by the ever-cheerful Amanda, and enlivened by notes and messages from fellow sufferers in far-off cells. Mr. and Mrs. Henry Walmers, Jr., called, and had private theatricals in the passage. Dried ginger parties were held about the invalid's birth, poems were composed and conundrums circulated. A little newspaper was concocted, replete with wit and spirit, by these secluded ladies, and called the Sherald, to distinguish it from the Herald, got up by sundry gentlemen whose shining hours were devoted to flirtation, cards, and wine. Perfect gentlemen, I assure you, my dear, for, drunk or sober, they wear yellow kids from morning till night, smoke the best cigars, and dance divinely, as Mrs. Twaddle said, sitting erect in the saloon, shrouded in fur and velvet, and with five diamond rings well displayed, as she recounted the diseases she had enjoyed and did the honours of a remarkable work-basket, containing eight different sorts of scissors. "'We shall be in to-morrow, so you'd better be digging up the treasures you have buried, you old magpie,' said Matt, appearing to the pensive Livy on the eleventh day. "'The sun is out. Come on deck and help us get up the last edition of our paper. "'How will this do? Query, if steamers are named the Asia, the Russia, and the Scotia, why not call one the Nausha? added Amanda, popping her head into the den." Lavinia threw a pillow at her, but the undaunted joker continued. Also this, financial, this being a feminine paper, gold is no longer at pa, but at ma. Good. Add this, argument in favor of the superiority of women. The sluggard was not told to go to his uncle. Thank you. And Amanda departed to twine with her forty-third bosom friend, while Lavinia disinterred, from holes and corners of her berth, money, nuts, and raisins, books, biscuits, and literary efforts much the worse for deluges of soap and daubs of butter. The cry of land on the morrow caused passengers unseen before to appear like worms after a shower. All heroically did up their back hair, put on their best suits, and walked forth with the delusive hope that no one would know how ill they had been. A French marquis with a sickly little son, whose diet of fried potatoes and sour wine accounted for his having the temper of a young fiend, appeared, and were made much of by dear, title-loving Americans. A Spanish opera singer, stout, saffron-colored, and imperious, likewise emerged from obscurity, with a meek little husband who waited on her like a servant, and a big bald parrot who swore like a trooper. 
a mysterious lady in green velvet with many diamonds and a shabby speechless companion sailed about the ship regardless of the rumours told of her deserted husbands stolen jewellery lovers waiting on the other side and many equally pleasant little tales the gentlemen with orange gloves and copper-coloured noses got themselves up in the most superb style though few were going to land at brest and took tender farewells of such ladies as did each professing desolation and despair at the termination of a twelve days flirtation i am not fond of dirt but i could kneel down and kiss the mud so grateful am i to feel solid ground under my feet after leading the life of a fly for so long said lavinia with emotion as the three trudged up the wharf at brest into a sort of barn which served for a custom-house <laughs> now let each sit upon her luggage and clamour till some one comes and examines it else it will get whisked away heaven only knows where ordered amanda who was the leader in right of her knowledge of tongues each perched accordingly on her one big trunk and tried to clamour but nothing came of it save loss of time and temper for no one paid the slightest heed to them and it was maddening to see trunk after trunk passed and sent off followed by its rejoicing owner especially hard to bear was the sight of the green velvet sinner who with a smile or two won the sternest official to pass her five trunks without turning a key and sailed away with a scornful glance at the virtuous three planted on their property and feebly beckoning for help i shall bear this no longer matt sit there and guard the small things while you and i livy charge boldly among these imbeciles and drag them to their duty and amanda marched away to clutch a cockaded victim by the shoulder with an awe-inspiring countenance lavinia picked out a feeble grey officer and dogged him like an indian smiling affably and pointing to her luggage with a persistent mildness that nearly drove the poor man mad no matter where he went or what he did no matter how thick the crowd about him or how loud the din still like a relentless ghost that mild old lady was ever at his side mutely pointing and affably smiling of course he gave in lifted one tray saw much flannel nearly blew his venerable nose off sniffing at one suspicious bottle and slamming down the lid scrawled a mysterious cross bowed and fled proudly returning to amanda the victorious one found her friend in a high state of indignation for no officer there would touch a trunk because some american express had put little leaden stamps here and there for some unknown purpose not even in her best french could the irate lady make the thick-headed man understand that it was not a high crime against the nation to undo a strap till some superior officer arrived to take the responsibility of so rash a step if they had comprehended the dire threats the personal remarks and unmitigated scorn of those three fair travellers the blue-coated imbeciles who would have been reduced to submission fortunately the great man came in at time to save them from utter rout for the ladies were just trying to decide whether to go and leave the luggage to its fate or to haul it forth and depart v et armis when a stout old party came saw said it is nothing pass the trunk a thousand pardons madame and peace was restored instantly the porters who till then had stood back eyeing the innocent black ark as if it was an infernal machine liable to explode at a touch threw themselves upon it bore forth and heaving it atop of an omnibus returned to demand vast sums for having waited so long then was amanda sublime then did her comrades for the first time learn the magnitude of her powers and realize the treasure they possessed stowing matilda and the smaller traps in the bus and saying to lavinia stand by me this dauntless maid faced one dozen blue blouse black-bearded vociferous demonstrative frenchmen and calmly offering the proper sum refused to add one sow more vainly the drivers perjured themselves in behalf of the porters vainly the guard looked on with imposing uniforms and impertinent observations vainly matt cried imploringly pay anything and let us get off before there is a mob still the indomitable amanda held forth the honest frank and when no one would take it laid it on the post and entering the omnibus drove calmly away what should we do without you sighed lavinia with fervent gratitude be cheated right and left and never know it dear responded amanda preparing for another fight with the omnibus driver and she had it for unwarned by the fate of the porters this short-sighted man insisted on carrying the ladies to a dirty little hotel to dine though expressly ordered to go at once to the station nothing would induce them to alight though the landlord came out in person and begged them to do so and after a protracted struggle and a drive all over the town they finally reached the depot 
Here another demand for double fare was promptly quenched by an appeal to the chef de station, who, finding that Mademoiselle was wide awake, crushed the driver, and saw justice done. Exhausted but triumphant, the three at length found themselves rolling slowly towards Morlaix through a green and Chapter Two, Part One of Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor Howard, Greencastle, Indiana. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Two, Part One, Brittany. After a late dinner, at which their appetites were pretty effectually taken away by seeing dishes of snails passed round and eaten like nuts, with large pins to pick out the squirming meat, a night's rest somewhat disturbed by the incessant chatter of sabo in the market place, and a breakfast rendered merry by being served by a garçon whom Dickens would have immortalized. Our travellers went on to Con Dinan. Here began their adventures, properly speaking. They were obliged to drive fourteen miles to Dinan, in a ramshackle carriage drawn by three fierce little horses, with their tails done up in braided chignon, and driven by a humpback. This elegant equipage was likewise occupied by a sleepy old priest, who smoked his pipe without stopping the whole way also by a large, loquacious, beery man who talked incessantly, informing the company that he was a friend of Victor Hugo, a child of nature aged sixty, and obliged to drink much ale because it went to his head and gave him commercial ideas. If it had given him no others it would have done well, but after each draught, and he took many, this child of nature became so friendly that even the free and easy Americans were abashed. Matilda quailed before the languishing glances he gave her, and tied her head up like a bundle in a thick veil. The scandalized Lavinia, informing him that she did not understand French, assumed the demeanor of a griffin and stared stonily into space, when she was not dislocating her neck, trying to see if the top-heavy luggage had not tumbled off behind. Poor Amanda was thus left a prey to the beery one, for having at first courteously responded to his paternal remarks, and expressed an interest in the state of France, she could not drop the conversation all at once, even when the friend of Victor Hugo became so disagreeable that it is to be hoped the poet has not many such. He recited poems, he sung songs, he made tender confidences and finished by pressing the hand of Mademoiselle to his lips. On being told that such demonstrations were not permitted to strangers in America, he beat his breast and cried out, My God, so beautiful and so cold! You do not comprehend that I am but a child. Pardon, and smile again, I conjure you. But Mademoiselle would not smile and folding her hands in her cloak appeared to slumber, whereat the grey-headed infant groaned pathetically, cast his eyes heavenward, and drank more ale, muttering to himself, and shaking his head as if his emotions could not be entirely suppressed. These proceedings caused Lavinia to keep her eye on him, being prepared for any outbreak, from a bullet all round to proposals to both her charges at once. With this smouldering bombshell inside, and the firm conviction that one if not all the trunks were lying in the dust some miles behind, it may be inferred that Duenna Livy did not enjoy that breakneck drive lurching and bumping up hill and down, with nothing between them and destruction apparently but the little humpback, who drove recklessly. In this style they rattled up to the Porte de Brest feeling that they had reached Dinan only by the grace of God, as the beery man expressed it when he bowed and vanished, still oppressed with a gloomy discovery that American women did not appreciate him. While Amanda made inquiries at an office, 
and Matilda had raptures over the massive archway crowned with yellow flowers, Lavinia was edified by a new example of woman's right to labour. Close by was a clean, rosy old woman, whose unusual occupation attracted our spinster's attention. Whisking off the wheels of a diligence, the old lady greased them one by one and put them on again with the skill and speed of a regular blacksmith and then began to pile many parcels into a char apparently waiting for them. She was a brisk, cheery old soul, with the colour of a winter apple in her face, plenty of fire in her quick black eyes, and a mouthful of fine teeth, though she must have been sixty. She was dressed in the costume of the place, a linen cap with several sharp gables to it, a gay kerchief over her shoulders, a blue woollen gown short enough to display a pair of sturdy feet and legs in neat shoes with bunches of ribbons on the instep, and black hose. A grey apron with pockets and a bib finished her off, making a very sensible as well as picturesque costume. She was still hard at it when a big boy appeared, and began to heave the trunks into another char, but gave out at the second which was large. Instantly the brisk old woman put him aside, hoisted in the big boxes without help, and catching up the shafts of the heavily laden cart, trotted away with it at a pace which caused the Americans, who prided themselves on their muscle, to stare after her in blank amazement. When next seen she was toiling up a steep street, still ahead of the lazy boy, who slowly followed with the lighter load. It did not suit Lavinia's ideas of the fitness of things to have an old woman trundle three heavy trunks, while she herself carried nothing but a parasol, and she would certainly have lent a hand if the vigorous creature had not gone at such a pace that it was impossible to overtake her, till she backed her cart up before a door in most scientific style, and with a bow, a smile, and a courteous wave of the hand, informed them that— here the ladies would behold the excellent Madame C. They did behold, and also receive, a most cordial welcome from the good lady, who not only embraced them with effusion, but turned her house upside down for their accommodation, merely because they came recommended to her hospitality by a former lodger who had won her kind old heart. While she purred over them, the luggage was being bumped upstairs, the old woman shouldering trunk after trunk, and trudging up two steep flights in the most marvellous way. But best of all was her surprise and gratitude on receiving a larger fee than usual, for the ladies were much interested in this dear old Hercules in a cap of seven gables. When she had lessed them all round, and trotted briskly away with her carts, Madame C. informed the newcomers that the worthy soul was a widow with many children, whom she brought up excellently, supporting them by acting as porter at the hotel. Her strength was wonderful, and she was very proud of it, finding no work too hard, yet always neat, cheery, and active, asking no help, and literally earning her daily bread by the sweat of her brow. The ladies often saw her afterward, always trotting and tugging, smiling and content, as if some unseen hands kept well greased the wheels of her own diligence, which carried such a heavy load, and never broke down. Miss Lavinia, being interested in woman's rights and wrongs, was much impressed by the new revelations of the capabilities of her sex, and soon ceased to be surprised at any demonstration of feminine strength, skill, and independence, for everywhere the women took the lead. They not only kept house, reared children, and knit every imaginable garment the human frame can wear, but kept the shops and the markets, tilled the gardens, cleaned the streets, and bought and sold cattle, leaving the men free to enjoy the only pursuits they seemed inclined to follow, breaking horses, mending roads, and getting drunk. The market seemed entirely in the hands of the women, and lively scenes they presented to unaccustomed eyes, especially the pig market, held every week, in the square before Madame C.'s house. At dawn the squealing began, and was kept up till sunset. The carts came in from all the neighbouring hamlets, with tubs full of infant pigs, over which the women watched with maternal care, till they were safely deposited among the rows of tubs that stood along the walk facing Anne of Bretagne's grey old tower, and the pleasant promenade which was once the fosse about the city walls. 
Here Madame would seat herself and knit briskly till a purchaser applied, when she would drop her work, dive among the pink innocents, and hold one up by its unhappy leg, undisturbed by its doleful cries, while she settled its price with a blue-gowned, white-capped neighbour as sharp-witted and shrill-tongued as herself. If the bargain was struck, they slapped their hands together in a peculiar way, and the new owner clapped her purchase into a meal-bag, slung it over her shoulder, and departed with her squirming, squealing treasure, as calmly as a Boston lady with a satchel full of ribbons and gloves. More mature pigs came to the market on their own legs, and very long, feeble legs they were, for a more unsightly beast than a Breton pig was never seen out of a toy Noah's Ark. Tall, thin, high-backed, and sharp-nosed, these porcine victims tottered to their doom, with dismal wailings and not a vestige of spirit, till the trials and excitement of the day goaded them to rebellion, when their antics furnished fun for the public. Miss Livy observed that the women could manage the pigs when men failed entirely. The latter hustled, lugged, or lashed, unmercifully and unsuccessfully, the former, with that fine tact which helps them to lead nobler animals than pigs, would soothe, sympathize, coax, and gently beguile the poor beasts, or devise ways of mitigating their bewilderment and woe, which did honour to the sex, and triumphantly illustrated the power of moral suasion. One amiable lady, who had purchased two small pigs and a coop full of fowls, attempted to carry them all on one donkey, but the piggies rebelled lustily in the bags, the ducks remonstrated against their unquiet neighbours, and the donkey indignantly refused to stir a step till the unseemly uproar was calmed. But the Breton was equal to the occasion, for, after a pause of meditation, she solved the problem by tying the bags round the necks of the pigs, so that they could enjoy the prospect. This appeased them at once, and produced a general lull, for when the pig stopped squealing, the ducks stopped quacking, the donkey ceased his bray, and the party moved on in dignified silence, with the youthful pigs, one black, one white, serenely regarding life from their bags. Another time a woman leading a newly bought cow came through the square, where the noise alarmed the beast so much that she became unruly, and pranced in a most dangerous manner. Miss Livy hung out of the window, breathless with interest, and ready to fly with brandy and bandages at a minute's notice, for it seemed inevitable that the woman would be tossed up among the lindens before the cow was conquered. The few men who were lounging about stood with their hands in their pockets, watching the struggle without offering to help, till the cow scooped the lady up on her horns, ready for a toss. Livy shrieked. But Madame just held on, kicking so vigorously that the cow was glad to set her down, when, instead of fainting, she coolly informed the men, who, seeing her danger, had approached, that she could arrange her cow for herself and did not want any help, which she proved by tying a big blue handkerchief over the animal's eyes, producing instant docility, and then she was led away by her flushed but triumphant mistress, who calmly settled her cap and took a pinch of snuff to refresh herself, after a scuffle which would have annihilated most women. When Madame C.'s wood was put in, the newcomers were interested in watching the job, for it was done in a truly Bretonesque manner. It arrived in several odd carts, each drawn by four great horses, with two men to each team, and as the carts were clumsy, the horses wild, and the men stupid, the square presented a lively spectacle. At one time there were three carts, twelve horses, and six men, all in a snarl, while a dozen women stood at their doors and gave advice. One was washing a lettuce, another dressing her baby, a third twirling her distaff, and a fourth with her little bowl of soup, which she ate in public while gesticulating so frantically that her sabot clattered on the stones. The horses had a free fight, and the men swore and shouted in vain, till the lady with the baby suddenly went to the rescue. Planting the naked cherub on the doorstep, this energetic matron charged in among the rampant animals, and by some magic touch untangled the teams, quieted the most fractious, a big grey brute, prancing like a mad elephant, then returned to her baby, who was placidly eating dirt, and with a polite, 
Voilà, monsieur. She whipped little Jean into his shirt, while the men sat down to smoke. It took two deliberate men nearly a week to split the gnarled logs, and one brisk woman carried them into the cellar and piled them neatly. The men stopped about once an hour to smoke, drink cider, or rest. The woman worked steadily from morning till night, only pausing at noon for a bit of bread and the soup good Costa sent out to her. The men got two francs a day, the woman half a franc, and as nothing was taken out of it for wine or tobacco, her ten cents probably went further than their forty. This same capable lady used to come to market with a baby on one arm, a basket of fruit on the other, leading a pig, driving a donkey, and surrounded by sheep, while her head bore a pannier of vegetables, and her hands spun busily with a distaff. How she ever got on with these trifling encumbrances was a mystery, but there she was, busy, placid, and smiling, in the midst of the crowd, and at night went home with her shopping, well content. The washerwomen were among the happiest of these happy souls, and nowhere were seen prettier pictures than they made, clustered around the fountains or tanks by the way, scrubbing, slapping, singing, and gossiping as they washed or spread their linen on the green hedges and daisied grass in the bright spring weather. One envied the cheery faces under the queer caps, the stout arms that scrubbed all day, and were not too tired to carry home some chubby Jeanne or little Marie when night came, and most of all the contented hearts in the broad bosoms under the white kerchiefs, for no complaint did one hear from these hard-working happy women. The same brave spirit seems to possess them now as that which carried them heroically to their fate in the Revolution, when hundreds of mothers and children were shot at Nantes, and died without a murmur. But of all the friends the strangers made among them, they liked old Mère Houdon best, a shriveled leaf of a woman, who at ninety-two still supported her old husband of ninety-eight. He was nearly helpless, and lay in bed most of the time, smoking while she peeled willows at a sou a day, trudged up and down with herbs, cresses, or any little thing she could find to sell. Very proud was she of her master, his great age, his senses still quite perfect, and most of all his strength, for now and then the old tyrant left his bed to beat her, which token of conjugal regard she seemed to enjoy as a relic of early days, and a proof that he would long be spared to her. She kept him exquisitely neat, and if any one gave her a plate of food, a little snuff, or any small comfort for her patient old age, she took it straight to the master, and found a double happiness in giving and seeing him enjoy it. She had but one eye, her amiable husband having put out the other once on a time as she was leading him home tipsy from market. The kind soul bore no malice, and always made light of it when forced to tell how the affliction befell her. My Ivan was so gay in his young days, truly, yes, a fine man, and now most beautiful to see in his clean bed, with the new pipe that Mademoiselle sent him. Come, then, and behold him, my superb master, who at ninety-eight still has this strength so wonderful. The ladies never cared to see him more than once, but often met the truly beautiful old wife as she toiled to and fro, finding her faithful love more wonderful than his strength, and feeling sure that when she lies at last on her clean bed, some good angel will repay these ninety-two hard years with the youth and beauty, happiness and rest, which nothing can destroy. Not only did the women manage the affairs of this world, but had more influence than men with the good powers of heaven. A long draught parched France that year, and even fertile Brittany suffered. More than once processions of women, led by priests, poured through the gates to go to the Croix de Saint-Esprit and pray for rain. "'Why don't the men go also?' Miss Livy asked. "'Ah, they pray to the Virgin, and she listens best to women,' was the answer. She certainly seemed to do so, for gracious showers soon fell, and the little gardens bloomed freshly where the mother's hard hands had planted cabbages, onions, and potatoes to feed the children through the long winter. Nor were these the only tasks the women did. The good ladies had a hospital, and a neater, cheerier place was never seen. 
few invalids, but many old people sitting in the sunny gardens, or at work in the clean rooms. La Garaille is in ruins now, but the memory of its gentle lady still lives, and is preserved in this benevolent institution for the sick, the old, and poor. A school for girls was kept by the good nuns, and the streets at certain hours were full of little damsels, with round caps on their braided hair, queer long gowns of blue, white aprons and handkerchiefs, who went clattering by in their wooden shoes, bobbing little curtsies to their friends, and readily answering any questions inquisitive strangers asked them. They learned to read, write, sew, and say the catechism, also to sing, for often as the ladies passed the little chapel of Our Lady, a chorus of sweet young voices came to us, making the flowery garden behind the church of saint Saveur a favorite resting place. In endeavoring to account for the freedom of the women here, it was decided that it was owing to Anne of Brittany, the gentle and generous duchess, to whom her husband Louis the Twelfth allowed the uncontrolled government of the duchy. Relics of the Fier Breton, as Louis called her, are still treasured everywhere, and it was pleasant to know not only that she was an accomplished woman writing tender letters in Latin verse to her husband, but also a wise and just princess to her people, showing herself by spirit and independence to be the most worthy of all her race to wear the ducal crown. So three cheers for good Duchess Anne, and long life to the hardy, happy women of Brittany. While Miss Lavinia was making these observations and moralizing upon them, the younger ladies were enjoying discoveries and experiences more to their tastes. They had not been in the house half a day before Madame C. informed them that Mademoiselle, the so charming miss whom they beheld at dinner, was to be married very soon, and they should have the rapture of witnessing a wedding the most beautiful. They welcomed the prospect with pleasure, for Dinah was not a whirl of gaiety at the best of times, and that spring the draught, rumours of war, and fears of smallpox cast a shadow upon the sunny little town. So they surveyed Mademoiselle Pelagie with interest, and longed to behold the happy man who was to be blessed with the hand of this little yellow-faced girl, with red eyes, dirty hands, and a frizzled crop, so like a wig they could never make up their minds that it was not. Madame, the mamma, a buxom comely widow, who breakfasted in black moire, with a diadem of glossy braids on her sleek head, and many jet ornaments rattling and glistening about her person, informed them, with voluble affability, of the whole affair. My brother, Monsieur le Président, had arranged the marriage. Pelagie was twenty, and beautiful, as you behold. It was time to establish her, mon Dieu, yes, though my heart is lacerated to lose my angel. I consent. I conduct her to a ball, that she may be seen by the young man whose parents desire that he should espouse my infant. He beholds her. He says, Great heavens, I adore her. My father, I consent. He is presented to me, we converse. She regards him with the angelic modesty of a young girl, but speaks not. I approve, the parents meet, it is arranged, and Jules is betrothed to my Pelagie. They have not met since, but next week he comes for the mariage, and he will be permitted to address her in my presence. Ah, yes, your customs are not as ours, and to us seem of a deplorable freedom. Pardon that I say it. On inquiring how Pelagie regarded her future lord, they found that she thought very little about him, but was absorbed in her trousseau, which she proudly displayed. To those accustomed to see and hear of American outfits, with their lavish profusion and extravagant elegance, poor little Pelagie's modest stores were not at all imposing. Half a dozen pretty dresses from Paris, several amazing hats, all rosebuds, lace, and blue ribbon, a good deal of embroidery, and a few prophetic caps completed the outfit. One treasure, however, she was never tired of displaying a gift from Jules, a camel's hair shawl in a black walnut case on which was carved the Clomadoc arms. A set of pearls were also from the bridegroom, but the shawl was her pride, for married women alone could wear such, 
and she seemed to think this right of more importance than any the wedding-ring could confer upon her. To the young ladies, both of whom had known many of the romantic experiences which befall comely American girls, the idea of marrying a man whom they had seen only twice seemed horrible, and to have but one week of courtship and that in Mama's presence was simply an insult and a wrong which they could not bear to think of. But Pelagie seemed quite content, and brooded over her finery like a true Frenchwoman, showing very little interest in her jewels, and only anxious for the time to come when she could wear her shawl and be addressed as Madame. While waiting for the grand event, the girls amused themselves with Gaston, the brother of the bride-elect. He was a languid, good-looking youth of three-and-twenty, who assumed blasé airs and attitudinized for their benefit. Sometimes he was lost in fits of Byronic gloom, when he frowned over his coffee, sighed gustily, and clutched his brow, regardless of the curls, usually in ambrosial order. The damsels, instead of being impressed by this display of inward agony, only laughed at him, and soon rallied him out of his heroics. Then he would try another plan, and become all devotion, presenting green tulips, ancient coins, early fruit, or sketches of his own, so very small that the design was quite obscure. If these delicate attentions failed to touch the stony hearts of the blonde Americans, he would air his entire wardrobe, appearing before them one day in full Breton costume of white cloth, embroidered in gay silks, buckled shoes, and hat adorned with streaming ribbons and flowers. Quite Arcadian was Gaston in this attire, and very effective on the croquet ground, where sundry English families disported themselves on certain afternoons. Another time he would get himself up like a Parisian dandy bound for a ride in the Bois de Boulogne, and mounting with much difficulty a rampant horse, he would caracol about the Place Saint-Louis, to the great delight of the natives. But this proved a failure, for one of the fair but cruel strangers donned hat and habit, and entirely eclipsed his glories by galloping about the country like an Amazon. The only time Gaston played escort she was nearly the death of him, for he seldom did more than amble a mile or two, and a hard trot of some six or eight miles reduced our Adonis to such a state of exhaustion that he fell into his mother's arms on dismounting, and was borne away to bed with much lamentation. After that he contented himself with coming to show himself in full dress whenever he went to a party and as that was nearly every other evening, they soon got accustomed to hearing a tap at their door, and beholding the comely youth in all the bravery of glossy broadcloth, a lavish shirt-bosom, miraculous tie, primrose gloves, varnished shoes, and curls and moustache anointed and perfumed in the most exquisite style. He would bow and say, Bonsoir, then stand to be admired with the artless satisfaction of a child, after which he would smile complacently, wave his crush hat, and depart with a flourish. Dear dandified, vain Gaston, his great desire was to go to Paris, and when the war came he had his wish, but found sterner work to do than to dress and dance and languish at the feet of ladies. I hope it made a man of him, and fancy it did, for the French fight well and suffer bravely for the country they love in their melodramatic fashion. As the day approached for the advent of the bridegroom, great excitement prevailed in the quiet household. Madame C. and her handmaid, dear old Marie, cackled and bustled like a pair of important hens. Madame F., the widow, lived at the milliner's, so to speak, and had several dress rehearsals for her own satisfaction. Gaston mounted guard over his sister, lest some enamoured man should rend her from him ere her jewels could secure the prize and Pelagie placidly ate and slept, kept her hair in crimping pins from morning till night, wore out her old clothes, and whiled away the time munching bonbons and displaying her shawl. Mercy on us! I should feel like a lamb being fattened for the sacrifice if I were in her place, cried one of the free-born American citizenesses, with an air of unmitigated scorn for French ways of conducting this interesting ceremony. 
"'I should feel like a galley slave,' said the other, "'for she can't go anywhere without Gaston or Mamma at her elbow. "'Only yesterday she went into a shop alone, while Gaston waited at the door, "'and when she told it at home as a great exploit, "'all the ladies shrieked with horror at the idea, "'and Mamma said, wringing her hands, "'Mon Dieu! But they will think thou art a married woman, "'for it is inconceivable that any girl should do so bold a thing.' "'And Pelagie wept.' and implored them not to tell Jules, lest he should discard her. Here the Americans all groaned over the pathetic absurdity of the whole affair, and wondered with unrighteous glee what the decorous ladies below would say to some of their pranks at home. But, fearing that Monsieur le Président might feel it his duty to eject them from the town as dangerous persons, they shrouded their past sins in the most discreet silence, and assumed their primmest demeanour in public. "'He has come! Look quick, girls!' cried Lavinia, as a carriage stopped at the door, and a rushing sound as of many agitated skirts was heard in the hall. Three heads peeped from the window of the blue parlour, and three pairs of curious eyes were rewarded by a sight of the bridegroom as he alighted. "'Such a little man! Such a fierce moustache! Such a dignified strut! And such an imposing uniform as he wore!' for Jules Gustave Adolphe Marie Clomadoc was a colonel in some regiment stationed at Boulogne. Out he skipped, in he marched, and peeping over the banisters they saw him salute Madame F. with a stately kiss on the hand, then escort her up to her salon, bowing loftily, and twisting his tawny moustache with an air that gave him the effect of being six feet in height and broad in proportion. How he greeted his fiancée they knew not, but the murmur of voices came from the room in steady flow for hours, and Gaston flew in and out with an air of immense importance. At dinner the strangers were proudly presented to Monsieur le Colonel, and received affable bows from the little man, who flattered himself that he could talk English, and insisted on speaking an unknown tongue, evidently wondering at their stupidity in not understanding their own language. He escorted Madame down, sat between her and Pelagie, but talked only to her, while the girl sat silent and ate her dinner with an appetite which no emotion could diminish. It was very funny to see the small warrior do his wooing of the daughter through the mother, and the buxom widow played her part so well that an unenlightened observer would have said she was the bride-elect. She smiled, she sighed. She discoursed, she coquetted, and now and then plucked out her handkerchief and wept at the thought of losing the angel, who was placidly gnawing bones and wiping up the gravy on her plate with bits of bread. Jules responded with spirit, talked, jested, quoted poetry, paid compliments right and left, and now and then passed the salt, filled the glass, or offered a napkin to his fiancée, with a French shrug and a tender glance. Chapter Two, Part Two, of Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eleanor Howard, Greencastle, Indiana. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott. CHAPTER Two, PART Two, Brittany After dinner Madame F. begged him to recite one of his poems, for it appeared that this all-accomplished man was beloved of the muse, and twanged the lyre as well as wielded the sword. With much persuasion and many modest apologies, Jules at length consented, took his place upon the rug, thrust one hand into his bosom, turned up his eyes, and in a tremendous voice, declaimed a pensive poem of some twenty stanzas, called Adieu to My Past. The poet's friends listened with rapt countenances and frequent bursts of emotion or applause, 
but the americans suffered agonies for the whole thing was so absurdly melodramatic that it was with great difficulty they kept themselves from explosions of laughter when the little man dropped his voice to a hoarse whisper in bidding adieu to the lost loves of his youth tender-hearted old c sobbed in her napkin while livy only saved herself from hysterics by drinking a glass of water and pelagie ate sugar with her round eyes fixed on her lover's face without the slightest expression whatever when the poet mourned his blighted hopes and asked wildly of all the elements if he should live or die gaston cast reproachful glances at the alien charmer who had nipped his passion in the bud and when jules gave a sudden start slapped his brow and declared that he would live for his country old marie choked in her coffee while madame f clapped her fat hands and cried it is sublime the poem closed there and the providential appearance of their donkeys gave the ladies an excuse for retiring to their room where they laughed till they could laugh no more each meal was as good as a play and every glimpse they had of the little pair gave fresh food for mirth everything was so formal and polite so utterly unlike the free and easy customs of their native land that they were kept in alternate states of indignation and amusement the whole time jules never was alone with his pelagie for an instant such a breach of etiquette would have shocked the entire town in the walks and drives which the family took together madame was always at the colonel's side while gaston escorted his sister looking as if he was fast reaching a state of mind when he would give her away without a pang many guests came and went much kissing and bowing prancing and rustling went on up and down stairs stately old gentlemen called papers were signed fortunes discussed and gifts displayed pelagie went much to mass also to the barbers and the bath agitated milliners flew in and out a great load of trunks arrived from nantes where madame formerly lived and the day before the wedding a whole carriage full of clomadocs appeared and babel seemed to have come again a great supper was given that evening and the three were banished to their own rooms where however they fared sumptuously for madame c and good old marie ate with them having no place left them but the kitchen madame c was much hurt that she had not been asked to the wedding it seemed the least madame f could do after taking possession of the house and turning its rightful owner out of every room but the attic madame c was a gentlewoman and though a meek old soul this rudeness hurt her very much she said nothing but marie fumed and scolded fiercely and proposed that the neglected ones should all go away on the wedding day and make a fete for themselves somewhere so they decided to drive to Dinar, enjoy the fine views of the sea and saint malo dine and return at dusk leaving the house free for the wedding festivities the day was fine and the ladies were graciously invited to behold the bride before she left for church she looked as much like a fashion plate as it was possible for a living girl to look and they dutifully kissed her on both cheeks paid their compliments and retired thanking their stars that they were not in her place mamma was gorgeous to behold in royal purple and black lace gaston was so glossy and beruffled and begemmed that they gazed with awe upon the french adonis but the bridegroom was a sight for gods and men in full regimentals with a big sword so many orders that there was hardly room for them on his little breast and a cocked hat with a forest of feathers in which he extinguished himself at intervals how his tiny boots shone his tawny moustache bristled with importance and his golden epaulets glittered as he shrugged and pranced his honoured papa and mamma were both tall portly people beside whom the mannequin looked like a child livy quite longed to see madame clomadoc take little jules on her knee and amuse him with bonbons when he got impatient at the delay of the carriage the three peeped out of windows and over the banisters and got fine glimpses of the splendours below flocks of elegant ladies went sailing up the narrow stairs gentlemen with orders dandies wonderful to behold and a few children to play with the bridegroom as livy wickedly said adorned the hall and salon 
Every one talked at the top of his or her voice. Shrieks of rapture, groans of despair, greeted a fine toilette or a torn glove. Peals of laughter from the gentlemen and shrill cries from the infants echoed through the once peaceful halls. As Françoise said, it was truly divine. At eleven every one trooped into the carriages again. How they ever got so many full-dressed people into one carriage is a mystery to this day. But in they piled, regardless of trains, corpulency, or height, and coach after coach lumbered away to the church. The bride's carriage could not be got very near the door, so she tripped out to it, leaning on her uncle's arm, while the devoted Gaston bore her train. Mama sailed after in a purple cloud, and when two young damsels in arsenic green were packed in, away they went, leaving the bridegroom to follow. Then came the catastrophe. Stout Papa and Mama were safely in, a friend of Jules, some six feet high, shut himself up like a jackknife, and with a farewell wave of the cocked hat the small bridegroom skipped in after them. The coachman cracked his whip, intending to dash under the arched gateway in fine style, but alas, the harness was old, the big horses clumsy, and the road half paved. The traces gave way, the beasts reared, the big coach lurched, and dismal wails arose. Out burst the fierce little hero of the day and the tall friend, followed by installments. Great was the excitement as the natives gathered about the carriage with offers of help, murmurs of sympathy, and unseemly mirth on the part of the boys. Jules did the swearing, and never were heard such big oaths as fell from the lips of this irate little man. It really seemed as if he would explode with wrath. He dashed his impressive cocked hat upon the stones, laid his hand upon his sword, tore his hair, and clutched his moustache in paroxysms of despair. His bride was gone, waiting in agitated suspense for him. No other coach could be had, as the resources of the town had been exhausted. The harness was in a desperate state, the men at their wits' end how to mend it, and time flying fast. Mare and priest were waiting, the whole effect of the wedding was being ruined by this delay, and ten thousand devils seemed to possess the awkward coachman. During the flurry, Papa Clomadoc appeared to slumber tranquilly in the recesses of the carriage. Mamma endeavoured to soothe her boy with cries of, "'Tranquilize yourself, my cherished son! It is nothing! Come, then, and reassure Papa!' Inhale the odour of my vinaigrette. It will compose your lacerated nerves, my angel. But the angel wouldn't come, and continued to dance and swear, and slap his hat about until the damages were repaired, when he flung himself exhausted into the carriage, and was borne away to his bride. A lively prospect for poor Pelagie! What a little fiend he is! Spinsters for ever! With these remarks the ladies ordered their own equipage, an infant omnibus, much in vogue in Dinan, where retired army officers, English or Scotch, drove about with their little families of eighteen or twenty. One Colonel Newcombe, a grave-looking man, used to come to church in a bus of this sort, with nine daughters and four sons, like a patriarch. The strangers thought it was a boarding-school, till he presented the entire flock with paternal pride as my treasures. Madame C., in a large leghorn bonnet, trembling with yellow bows, led the way with an air of lofty indifference as to what became of her house that day. Marie bore a big basket full of cold fowls, salad, and wines. She also was in a new spring hat of purple, which made her rosy old face look like a china aster. Lavinia reposed upon the other seat, and the infants insisted on sharing the driver's seat, up aloft, that they might enjoy the prospect, which freak caused Flabeau's boy to beam and blush till his youthful countenance was a deep scarlet. They had a pleasant day, for good old Madame soon recovered her temper, and beguiled the time with lively tales of her mother's trials during the Revolution. Marie concocted spiced drinks, salad that was a thing to dream of, not to tell, and produced such edible treasures that her big basket seemed bottomless. 
the frisky damsels explored ruins ran races on the hard beach sniffed the salt breezes and astonished the natives by swarming up and down precipices as they called the rocks that was a fatal day for flabo's boy they never knew his name for as if the wedding had flown to his head he lost his youthful heart to one of the lively damsels who invaded his perch such tender glances as his china-blue eyes cast upon her such grins of joy as he gave when she spoke to him such feats of agility as he performed leaping down to gather flowers or hurling himself over thorny hedges to point out a dolman or menier they never could remember which was which alas alas for flabo's boy deeply was he wounded that day by the unconscious charmer who would as soon have thought of inspiring love in the bosom of the broken-nosed saint by the wayside as in the heart that beat under the blue blouse i regret to say that the infants as madame c always called miss livy's charges behaved themselves with less decorum than could have been wished but the proud consciousness that they never could be disposed of as pelagie had been had such an exhilarating effect upon them that they frisked like the lambs in the field one drove the bus in a retired spot and astonished the stout horses by the way in which she bowled them along the fine hard road the other sang college songs to the intense delight of the old ladies who admired the chance amerique so gay and to the horror of their duenna who knew what they meant a shower came up and they would remain outside so the boy put up a leathern hood and they sat inside in such a merry mood that the silent youth suddenly caught the infection and burst forth into a breton melody which he continued to drone till they got home the house was a blaze of light when they arrived and Françoise, the maid came flying out to report sundry breakages and mishaps how the salad had precipitated itself downstairs dish and all how monsieur gaston was so gay so inconceivably gay that he could hardly stand and insisted on kissing her clandestinely that mademoiselle pelagie had wept much because her veil was torn and madame f had made a fresh toilette ravishing to behold would the dear lady survey the party still at table regard them from the little window in the garden and see if it is not truly a spectacle most superb they did regard them and saw the bride at the head of the table eating steadily through the dessert the bridegroom reciting poems with tremendous effect gaston almost invisible behind a barricade of bottles and madame f in violet velvet diamonds plumes and lace more sleek and buxom than ever the ladies all talked at once and the gentlemen drank healths every five minutes a very french and festive scene it was for the room was small and twenty mortals were stowed therein one fat lady sat in the fireplace papa clomadoc leaned his heavy head upon the sideboard and the plump shoulders of madame f were half out the front window but it was genteel oh i assure you yes as Françoise said how long they kept at it the weary trio did not wait to see but retired to their beds and slumbered peacefully waking only when gaston was borne up to his room chanting the marseillaise at the top of his voice next day monsieur and madame clomadoc junior made calls and pelagie had the joy of wearing her shawl for three days she astonished the natives by promenading with her lord in a fresh toilette each day on the fourth they all piled into a big carriage and went away to make a round of visits before the young people settled down at boulogne the americans never thought to hear any more of pelagie but as dear old madame c wrote to them several times after they left the little story may be finished here though the sequel did not actually come till a year later many were the sage predictions of the three as to the success of this marriage amanda approving of the style of the thing matilda objecting fiercely to the entire affair and lavinia firmly believing in the good old doctrine of love as your only firm basis for so solemn a bargain wagers were laid that the fiery little colonel would shoot some one in a jealous fit or that pelagie would elope or both charcoal themselves to death as the best way out of the predicament 
but none of them guessed how tragically it would really end. Late in the following spring came a letter from Madame C., telling them that Jules had gone to war and been shot in his first battle, that Pelagie was with her mother again, comforting herself for her loss with a still smaller Jules, who never saw his father, and, it is to be hoped, did not resemble him. So little Pelagie's brief romance ended, and one would fancy that the experiences of that year would make her quite content to remain under Mamma's wing, with no lord and master but the little son, to whom she was a very tender mother. Pleasant days those were in quaint old Dinan, for spring's soft magic glorified earth and sky, and a delicious sense of rest and freedom gave a charm to that quiet life. Legends of romance and chivalry hung about the ruins of castle and chateau, as green and golden as the ivy and bright wall-flowers that tapestried the crumbling walls and waved like banners from the turret-tops. Lovely walks into woods, starred with pale primroses, and fragrant with wild hyacinths, down green lanes leading to quaint cottages, or over wide meadows full of pink-tipped daisies and dear familiar buttercups, the same all the world over. Sometimes they took gay donkey drives to visit a solemn dolmen in a gloomy pine wood, with mistletoe hanging from the trees, and the ghosts of ancient druids haunting the spot. The cavalcade on such occasions was an imposing spectacle. Matilda, being fond of horses, likewise affected donkeys, or thought she did, till she tried to drive one, and usually went first in a small vehicle like a chair on wheels drawn by an animal who looked about the size of a mouse when the stately mat in full array, yellow parasol, long whip, camp-stool, and sketch-book, sat bolt upright on her perch, driving in the most approved manner. The small beast, after much whipping, would break into a trot, and go pattering over the hard white road, with his long ears wagging, and his tiny hoofs raising a great dust for the benefit of the other turnout just behind. In a double-chair sat Lavinia, bundled up as usual, and the amiable Amanda, both flushed with constant pokings and thrashings of their steed, a venerable ass, so like an old whitey-brown hair-trunk as to his body, and Nick Bottom's mask as to his head, that he was a constant source of mirth to the ladies. Mild and venerable as he looked, however, he was a most incorrigible beast, and it took two immortal souls and four arms to get the ancient donkey along. Vain all the appeals to his conscience, pity, or pride, nothing but a sharp poke among his ribs, a steady shower of blows on his fuzzy old back, and frequent yanks of the rain produced any effect. It was impossible to turn out for anything, and the ladies resigned themselves to the ignominy of sitting still in the middle of the road, and letting other carriages drive over or round them. On rare occasions the beast would bolt into the ditch as a vehicle drew near, but usually he paused abruptly, put his head down, and apparently went to sleep. Matilda got on better, because little Bernard du Guesclin, as she named her mouse, was so very small that she could take him up and turn him round bodily when other means failed, or pull him half into the chair if danger threatened in front. He was a sprightly little fellow, and had not yet lost all the ardour of youth, or developed the fiendish obstinacy of his kind, so he frequently ran little races, now and then pranced, and was not quite dead to the emotion of gratitude in return for bits of bread. Truly, yes, the fair mat with her five feet seven inches, and little Bernard, whose longest ear, when most erect, did not reach much above her waist, were a sweet pair of friends and caused her mates great amusement. "'I must have some one to play with, for I can't improve my mind all the time as Mandy does, or cuddle and doze like Livy. I've had experience with young donkeys of all sorts, and I give you my word little Bernie is much better fun than some I've known with shorter ears and fewer legs.' Thus Matilda, regardless of the jeers of her friends, when they proposed having the small beast into the salon to beguile the tedium of a rainy day. As the summer came on, picnics were introduced, and gay parties would pile into and on to Flabeau's small omnibus, and drive off to Hunande, Cotquien, La Bellier, Guignamp, or some other unpronounceable but most charming spot, for a day of sunshine and merry-making. The hospitable English came out strong on these occasions, 
with ampers of am sandwiches, bottled porter, and so on, don't you know? All in fine style, even the stout doctor donned his knickerbockers and grey hose, unfurled his Japanese umbrella, and with a pretty niece on either arm disported himself like a boy. But pleasantest of all were the daily strolls through the little town and its environs, getting glimpses of Breton manners and customs. The houses were usually composed of one room, where, near the open fire and fixed against the wall, stands the bedstead, or lit clos, of old oak shut in by carved sliding panels, often bearing an inscription or some sacred symbol. The mattresses and feather beds are so piled up that there is hardly room to creep in. Before it is the big chest containing the family wardrobe, answering the double purpose of a seat and a step by which to ascend the lofty bed. Cupboards on each side often have wide shelves where the children sleep. Settles and a long table complete the furniture. The latter often has little wells hollowed out in the top to hold the soup instead of plates. Over the table, suspended by pulleys, are two indispensable articles in a Breton house, a large round basket to cover the bread, and a wooden frame to hold the spoons. Festoons of sausages, hams, candles, onions, horseshoes, harness, and tools all hang from the ceiling. The floor is of beaten earth. One narrow window lets in the light. There are no outhouses, and pigs and poultry mingle freely with the family. The gardens are well kept, and produce quantities of fruit and vegetables. The chief food of the poorer class is bread or porridge of buckwheat, with cabbage soup made by pouring hot water over cabbage leaves and adding a bit of butter. They are a home-loving people, and pine like the Swiss if forced to leave their native land. They are brave soldiers and good sailors. Their vices, as a Breton writer says, are avarice, contempt for women, and drunkenness. Their virtues, love of home and country, resignation to the will of God, loyalty to each other, and hospitality. Their motto is, En tout chemin loyauté. They are very superstitious, and some of their customs are curious. At New Year pieces of bread and butter are thrown into the fountains, and from the way in which they swim the future is foretold. If the buttered side turns under, it forebodes death. If two pieces adhere together, it is a sign of sickness, and if a piece floats properly, it is an assurance of long life and prosperity. Girls throw pins into the fountain of Saloon, to tell by their manner of sinking when they will be married. If the pin goes down head foremost, there is little hope, but if the point goes first, it is a sure sign of being married that year. Their veneration for healing springs is very great, and though at times forbidden by the church, is still felt. Pounded snails worn in a bag on the neck is believed to be a cure for fever, and a certain holy bell rung over the head, a cure for headache. If we believe in that last remedy, what a ceaseless tingling that bell would keep up in America, said Lavinia, when these facts were mentioned to her. In some towns they have, in the cemetery, a bone-house or reliquary. It is the custom, after a certain time, to dig up the bones of the dead, and preserve the skulls in little square boxes like bird-houses, with a heart-shaped opening to show the relic within. The names and dates of the deceased are inscribed outside. St. Ives, or Eves, is a favorite saint, and images of him are in all churches and over many doors. He was one of the remarkable characters of the thirteenth century. He studied law in Paris, and devoted his talents to defending the poor. Hence he was called the poor man's advocate and so great is the confidence placed in his justice that even now when a debtor falsely denies his debt a peasant will pay twenty sous for a mass to st ives sure that the saint will cause the faithless creditor to die within the year or pay up his truthfulness was such that he was called saint ives de verite he was the special patron of lawyers but he does not seem to be their model the early monks taught people to work and their motto was, The Cross and the Plough, Labour and Prayer. They introduced apples, now the principal fruit of Brittany. Much cider is made and drank, and in old times they got their wine from France in exchange for wax and honey, as they were famous bee-keepers. 
great fields of buckwheat still afford food for the yellow-breeched philosophers and in many cottage gardens a row of queerly shaped hives stand in sunny nooks these monks were the model farmers of those days and their abbeys were fine farms one had twenty piggeries of three hundred pigs each in its forests the monks also reared sheep and horses and bred fish in their ponds many were also brewers weavers carpenters and so on evidently they lived up to their motto and laboured quite as much as they prayed and doubtless were saved by works as well as by faith the little place du guesclin with a stumpy statue of the famous knight in the middle and chestnut trees all round was a favourite resting-place of the ladies especially when the weekly fair was held and booths of all sorts were raised at one end here amanda bought a remarkable jack-knife which would cut nothing but her fingers matilda speculated in curious kinds of cake one sort being made into gigantic jumbles so light that they did excellently for grace hoops another sort being used by the vandals as catch-alls so deep and tough were they lavinia examined the various fabrics and got bits of linen as samples also queer earthen pots and pans impossible to carry away the church of saint saveur a dim and ancient little place with du guesclin's heart buried by the side of his wife was another haunt the castle now a prison contained the armchair in which duchess anne sat and the dungeons where were crammed two thousand english prisoners of war in the last century the view from the platform of the keep was magnificent extending to mont dol and the distant sea the sunny promenade on the fosse that goes half round the town was very charming with the old grey walls on one side and on the other the green valley with its luxuriant gardens and leafy lanes winding up to the ruined chateau or the undulating hills with picturesque windmills whirling on the heights on the other side of the town from the high gardens of the church one looked down into the deeper valley of the rance with the airy viaduct striding from hill to hill and the old part of the town nestling at its base soft and summery fertile and reposeful was the scene and the busy peasants at their work added to the charm pretty english children with breton nurses each in the costume of her native town played under the lindens all abloom with odorous flowers and alive with bees workmen came to these green places to eat the black bread and drink the thin wine that was all their dinner invalids strolled here after their baths at the little house in the rose garden below pretty girls walked there in the twilight with long-haired lovers in knee breeches and round hats nuns in their grey gowns went to and fro from hospital and the insane asylum or charity school and the beautiful old priest sometimes went feebly by smiling paternally on his flock who rose and uncovered reverently as he passed flowers were everywhere in the gardens of the rich at the windows of the poor the stalls in the market were gay with plumy lilacs splendid tulips roses of every shade and hyacinths heavy with odour all along the borders of the river waved the blossoming grass every green bank about the mills at lehon was yellow with dandelions and the sunny heads of little children welcoming the flower of the poor even the neglected churchyard of the ruined abbey where the tombs of the stately beau manoir still stand was bright with cheerful daisies and blue-eyed forget-me-nots the willows in the valley were covered with fragrant tassels and old women and children sat all day on door-stones and by the wayside stripping the long white wands for basket-making flax-fields were blooming in the meadows and acres of buckwheat with its rosy stems and snowy blossoms whitened the uplands with a fair prophecy of bread for all so garlanded about with early flowers and painted in spring's softest freshest colours Brittany remains for ever a pleasant picture in the memory of those who have been welcomed to its hospitable home. Chapter Three, Part One of Shawl Straps, a Second Series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott. 
Chapter Three, Part One, France. Girls, I have had a scintillation in the night. Listen and approve," said Amanda, coming into the room where her comrade sat upon the floor, in the first stages of despair at the impossibility of getting the accumulated rubbish of three months' travel into a couple of immense trunks. "'Blessed girl, you always bring a ray of light just at the darkest moment,' returned Lavinia with a sigh of relief, while Matilda looked over a barricade of sketch-books bristling with paint-brushes and added anxiously, "'If you could suggest how I'm to work this miracle, you will be a public benefactor.' "'Behold the amendment I propose,' began Amanda, perching herself on one of the arcs. "'We have decided to travel slowly and comfortably through France to Switzerland.' "'Stopping where we like, and staying as long as we please at any place we fancy, "'being as free as air, and having all the world before us where to choose, as it were. "'The route you have laid out is a charming one, and I don't see how you can improve it,' said Lavinia, "'who, though she was supposed to be the matron, guide, and protector of the younger girls, "'was in reality nothing but a dummy, used for Mrs. Grundy's sake, "'and let the girls do just as they pleased, only claiming the right to groan and moan as much as she liked,' when neuralgia, her familiar demon, claimed her for its own. One improvement remains to be made. Are these trunks a burden, a vexation of spirit, a curse? demanded Amanda, tapping one with her carefully cherished fingertips. They are, they are, groaned the others, regarding the monsters with abhorrence. Then let us get rid of them, and set out with no luggage but a few necessaries in a shell-strap. We will, we will, returned the chorus. "'Shall we burn up our rubbish or give it away?' asked Lavinia, who liked energetic measures and was ready to cast her garments to the four winds of heaven, to save herself from the agonies of packing. "'I shall never give up my pictures nor my boots!' cried Matilda, gathering her idols to her breast in a promiscuous heap. "'Be calm and listen,' returned the scintillator. "'Pack away all but the merest necessaries, and we will send the trunk by express to Lyons.' "'Then, with our travelling bags and bundles, we can follow at our leisure.' "'Tis well, tis well,' replied the chorus, and they all returned to their packing, which was performed in the most characteristic manner. Amanda never seemed to have any clothes, yet was always well and appropriately dressed, so it did not take her long to lay a few garments, a book or two, a box of Roman coin lockets, scarabay brooches, and sink cento rings— likewise a swell hat and habit, into her vast trunk, then lock and label it in the most business-like and thorough manner. Matilda found much difficulty in reconciling paint-pots and silk gowns, blue hats and statuary, French boots and Yankee notions. But order was at length produced from chaos, and the young lady refreshed her weary soul by painting large red M's all over the trunk to mark it for her own. Miss Lavinia packed and repacked four or five times, forgetting needfuls, which, of course, were always at the very bottom. At the fifth plunge into the depths, her patience gave out, and with a vow to be a slave no longer to her treacherous memory, she tumbled everything in, performed a solemn jig on the lid till it locked, then pasted large but illegible placards in every available spot, and rested from her labors with every nerve in a throbbing condition. Shawl straps of the largest, strongest sort were next procured, and three bundles made up with much discussion and merriment. Into Amanda's went a volume of Shakespeare of great size and weight, but as indispensable as a toothbrush to its owner. Toilet articles tied up in a handkerchief, a few necessary garments, and much paper, for Amanda was inspired with poetic fire at unexpected moments also had five hundred bosom friends, in answering whose epistolary gushings much stationery was consumed. A pistol, a massive crust of bread, and an oval box containing all the dainty appliances for the culture, preservation, and ornamentation of the fingernails made up her store. Matilda's bundle consisted of sketch-books, a trifle of haberdashery, a curling-stick that was always tumbling out at inopportune moments, yards of blue ribbon, and a camp-stool strapped outside in company with a Japanese umbrella, a gift from the stout doctor, destined to be cursed in many languages by the unhappy beings into whose backs, eyes, and stomachs it was poked before its wanderings ended. 
Lavinia confined herself to a choice collection of bottles and pill-boxes, fur boots, a grey cloud, and several French novels, the solace of wakeful nights. A scarlet army blanket with U.S. in big black letters on it enveloped her travelling medicine chest, and lent a cheerful air to the sombre spinster, whose black attire and hoarse voice made the sobriquet of Raven most appropriate. With these imposing bundles in one hand, little pouches slung over the shoulder, plain travelling suits, subdued hats, and resolute but benign countenances, our three errant damsels set forth one bright June day to wander through France at their own sweet will. Not a fear assailed them, for all men were civil, all women friendly, and the world wore its sunniest aspect. Not a doubt perplexed them, for the gifted Amanda spoke many tongues, understood all sorts of money, could grapple successfully with Murray and Bradshaw, and never got into the wrong corporation when she traced a route with unerring accuracy through the mysteries of an indicator. No lord and master, in the shape of brother, spouse, or courier, ordered their outgoings and incomings, but liberty the most attire was theirs, and they enjoyed it heartily. Wisely and well, too, for, though off the grand route, they behaved themselves in public as decorously as if the eyes of all prim Boston were upon them, and proved by their triumphant success that the unprotected might go where they liked if they conducted themselves with the courtesy and discretion of gentlewomen. How pleasant were the early sail down the rainy from Diane to St. Malo, the comfortable breakfast in the flowery little court of Hotel Franklin, and the stroll afterward about the quaint old town, looking at the churches, buying fruit, and stoutly resisting the temptations of antique jewelry displayed in the dingy shops. Lavinia never forgave herself, however, for not securing a remarkable watch, and Amanda sighed months afterwards for a Breton collar and cross of charming antiquity and ugliness. Matilda boldly planted her camp-stool, unfurled her umbrella, and, undaunted by the crowd of round-capped, blue-bloused, wooden-shoed children about her, began to draw the church. "'I intend to study architecture, and to sketch all the cathedrals we see,' said the ardent art student, struggling manfully with the unruly umbrella, the unsavory odors from the gutter, and the garrulous crowd leaning over her shoulder— peering under her hat-brim, and examining all her belongings, with a confiding freedom rather embarrassing. "'Do you know what impertinent things these little scamps are saying to you?' asked Amanda, pausing in a lecture on surface drainage which she was delivering to Lavinia, who was vainly struggling to cram a fat wine-bottle, a cabbage-leaf of strawberries, and some remarkable cakes into the lunch-basket. "'No, I don't, and that is the advantage of not knowing any language but my own,' complacently replied Matilda, who considered all study but that of art as time wasted, and made her small store of French answer admirably by talking very loud and fast, and saying, Oui, 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 on all occasions, with much gesticulation, and bows and smiles, of great suavity and sweetness. Clear out this rabble, or come back to the hotel and wait for the bus. We shall have the whole town round us soon, and I can't stand it, said Amanda who had no romantic admiration for the great unwashed. "'You think I can't do it? Voila!' And, rising suddenly to an unexpected height, Matilda waved the umbrella like a baton, cried, "Allez!" in a stern voice, and the children fled like chaff before the wind. "'You see how little is needed, so don't vex me with learning your old verbs any more,' and Matilda closed her book with an air of calm satisfaction." "'Come home and rest. It is so warm here I'm fairly melted,' prayed Lavinia, who had been longing for summer, and of course was not suited when she got it. "'Now do remember one thing. Don't let us be gregarious. We never know who we may pick up if we talk to people, and stray acquaintances are sad bores sometimes. Granny is such a cross old dear she won't say a word to anyone if she can help it. But you, Matt, can't be trusted if we meet anyone who talks English.' "'So be on your guard, or the peace of this party is lost,' said Amanda impressively. "'We are not likely to meet any but natives in this wilderness, so don't excite yourself, Mandy, dear,' replied Matilda, who, being of a social turn and an attractive presence, was continually making friends, to the great annoyance of her more prudent comrades. In the flowery courtyard sat the group that one meets everywhere on the continent, even in the wilds of Brittany. 
the father and mother stout, tired, and rather subdued by the newness of things, the son, young America personified, loud, important, and inquisitive, the daughter, pretty, affected, and overdressed, all on the lookout for adventures and titles, fellow countrymen to impress, and foreigners eager to get the better of them. Seeing the peril from afar, Amanda buried herself in Murray to read up the tomb of Chateaubriand, the tide's population, and any other useful bit of history. For Amanda was a thrifty soul, and gathered honey all the day from every opening flower. Lavinia, finding the court damp, shrouded herself in the grey cloud, put her feet on the red bundle, and fortified herself with a turner's pill. But Matilda, guileless girl, roamed to and fro, patted the horses at the gate, picked flowers that no French hand would have dared to touch, and studied the effect of light and shade on the red head of the garçon, who gazed sentimentally at the blonde Miss as he artlessly watered the wine for dinner. The Americans had their eye upon her, and felt that, though the others might be forbidding Englishwomen, this one could be made to talk. So they pounced upon their prey, to the dismay of her mates and proceeded to ask fifty questions to the minute. Poor Matt, glad to hear the sound of her native tongue, fell into the snare and grew more confiding every moment. "'She is telling the family history,' whispered Lavinia in a tone of despair. "'Now they're asking where we came from,' added Amanda, casting down her book in agony. "'Wink at her,' sighed Lavinia. "'Call to her,' groaned Amanda, as they heard their treasured secret betrayed, and the enemy clamoring for further information about this charming trip. "'Matilda, bring me my shawl,' commanded the dowager. "'Come and see if you don't think we'd better go direct to Tours,' said the wary Amanda, hoping to put the enemy off the track. The victim came, and vials of wrath were poured upon her head in one unceasing flow till the omnibus started, and the ladies were appeased by finding that the enemy did not follow." "'Promise that you won't talk to any but natives, or I decline to lead this expedition,' said Amanda firmly. "'I promise,' returned Matt, with penitent meekness. "'Now we've got her,' croaked the raven, "'for she'll have to learn French or hold her tongue. "'The language of the eye remains to me, and I am proficient in that, ma'am,' said Matt, "'razzed by these efforts to deny her the right of free speech. "'You are welcome to it, dear.' and Amanda departed to buy tickets and dispatch the trunks, with secret misgivings that they would never be found again. Now we're fairly started, with no more weighing of luggage, fussing over checks, or packing of traps to afflict us. What a heavenly sense of freedom it gives one to have nothing but an independent shawl-strap, said Matilda, as they settled themselves in a vacant car and stowed away the bundles. What a jolly day that was, to be sure! Whether it was the air, the good coffee, or the liberty, certain it is that three merrier maids never travelled from St. Malo to Le Mans on a summer's day. Even the raven forgot her woes, and became so exhilarated that she smashed her bromide bottle out of the window, declaring herself cured, and tried to sing Hail Columbia in a voice like an absmaic bagpipe. Matt amused herself and her comrades by picking up the different articles that kept tumbling down in her head from her badly built bundle, while Amanda scintillated to such an extent that the others laughed themselves into hysterics, and lay exhausted, prone upon the seats. They ate, drank, sung, gossiped, slept, read, and reveled, till another passenger got in, when propriety clothed them as with a garment, and the mirthful damsels became three studious statues. The newcomer was a little priest, so rosy and young that they called him the reverend boy. He seemed rather dismayed at first, but, finding the ladies silent and demure, he took heart and read diligently in a dingy little prayer book, stealing shy glances now and then from under his broad-brimmed hat at Amanda's white hands or Matilda's yellow locks, as if these vanities of the flesh had not quite lost their charms for him. By and by he fell asleep and leaned in his corner, making quite a pretty picture, for the ugly hat was off, his boyish face as placid as a child's, his buckled shoes and neat black stockinged legs stretched comfortably out, his plump hands folded over the dingy book, and the little bands lay peacefully on his breast. 
He was quite at their mercy now, so the three women looked as much as they liked, wondering if the poor dear boy was satisfied with the life he had chosen, and getting tenderly pitiful over the losses he might learn to regret when it was too late. His dreams seemed to be pleasant ones, however, for once he laughed a blithe boyish laugh, good to hear, and when he woke, he rubbed his blue eyes and stared about, smiling like a newly roused baby. He got out all too soon, was joined by several other clerical youths, and disappeared with much touching of big beavers and wafting of cassocks. Innocent reverend little boy, I wonder what became of him, and hope his sleep's as quiet now as then, his awakening as happy as it seemed that summer day. Six o'clock saw our damsels at Le Mans, and after dinner a sunset walk took them to the grand old cathedral, where they wandered till moonrise. Pure Gothic of the twelfth century, rich in stained glass, carved screens, tombs of kings and queens, dim little chapels where devout souls told their beads before shadowy pictures of saints and martyrs, while over all the wonderful arches seemed to soar, one above the other, light and graceful as the natural curves of drooping branches, or the rise and fall of some great fountain. "'We shall not see anything finer than this, I'm sure. It's a perfect revelation to me.' said Matilda, in a calm rapture at the beauty all about her. This is a pious-feeling church, and I could sing my prayers here with all my soul, for it seems as if the religion of centuries had got built into it, added Lavinia, thinking of the ugly imitations at home. You will both turn Catholic before we get through, prophesied Amanda, retiring to study the tomb of Berengaria, Coeur de Lyon's wife. The square before the hotel was gay with a market, many soldiers lounging about, and flocks of people eating ices before the cafés. The ladies enjoyed it from the balcony, and then slumbered peacefully in a great room with three alcoves, much muslin drapery, and a bowl and pitcher like a good-sized cup and saucer. Another look at the cathedral in the early morning, and then away to Tours, which place they found a big, clean, handsome city— all astir for the fete dieu. We will stay over Sunday and see it, was the general vote, as the trio headed for the great church, and, catching sight of it, they subsided into a seat by the fountain opposite, and sat looking silently at the magnificent pile. How strangely impressive and eloquent it was! The evening red touched its grey towers with a mellow light like sunshine on a venerable head. Lower down, flights of rock circled around the fretted niches, quaint windows and grotesque gargoyles, while the great steps below swarmed with priests and soldiers, gay strangers and black-robed nuns, children and beggars. For over an hour our pilgrims sat and studied the wonderful facade, or walked round the outside, examining the rich carvings that covered every inch of the walls. Twilight fell before they had thought of entering, and feeling that they had seen enough for that night, they went thoughtfully home to dream of solemn shadows and saintly faces, for the cathedral haunted them still. Next day was spent in viewing Charlemagne's tower, and seeing the grand procession in honor of the day. The streets were hung with garlands, gay tapestries and banners, strewn with fresh boughs, and lined with people in festive array. As the procession passed, women ran out and scattered rose-leaves before it, and one young mother set her blooming baby on a heap of greenery in the middle of the street, leaving it there, that the holy ghost under its canopy might pass over it. A pretty sight, the rosy little creature, smiling in the sunshine as it sat playing with its own blue shoes, while the golden pageant went by, the chanting priests stepping carefully, and looking down with sudden benignity in their tired faces, as the holy shadow fell on the bright head, making baby blessed, and saved for ever in its pious mother's eyes. A great band played finely, scarlet soldiers followed, then the banners of patron saints were borne by children. St. Agnes and her lamb led a troop of pretty little girls carrying tall white lilies, filling the air with their sweetness. Mary, our mother, was followed by many orphans with black ribbons crossed over the young hearts that had lost so much. St. Martin led the charity boys in purple suits of just the color of the mantle he was dividing with the beggar on the banner, a pleasant emblem of the charitable cloak that covers so many. Priests in full splendor placed solemnly along with censers swinging, 
candles flickering, sweet-voiced boys singing, and hundreds kneeling as they passed. Most impressive figures, unless one caught a glimpse of something comically human to disturb the effect of the heavenly pageant. Lavinia had an eye for the ludicrous, and though she dropped a tear over the orphans, and with difficulty resisted a strong desire to catch and kiss the pretty baby, she scandalized her neighbors by laughing outright the next minute. A particularly portly, pious-looking priest, who was marching with superb dignity and chanting like a devout bumblebee, suddenly mislaid his temper and injured the effect by boxing a charity boy's ears with his gilded missal, and then capped the climax by taking a pinch of snuff with a sonorous satisfaction that convulsed the heretic. The afternoon was spent in the church, wandering to and fro, each alone to study and enjoy her own way. Matilda lost her head entirely and had silent raptures over the old pictures. Amanda said her prayers, looked up her dates, and imparted her facts in a proper and decorous manner, while Lavinia went up and down, finding for herself little pictures not painted by hands, and reading histories more interesting to her than those of saints and martyrs. In one dim chapel, with a single candle lighting up the divine sorrow of the Mater Dolorosa, knelt a woman in deep black, weeping and praying all alone. In another flowery nook dedicated to the infant Jesus, a peasant girl was telling her beads over the baby asleep in her lap, her sunburnt face refined and beautiful by the tenderness of mother-love. In the third chapel a pale, wasted old man sat propped in a chair while his rosy old wife prayed heartily to St. Gratian, the patron saint of the church, for the recovery of her John Anderson. And most striking of all was a dark, handsome young man, well-dressed and elegant, who was waiting at the door of a confessional with some great trouble in his face, as he muttered and crossed himself, while his haggard eyes were fixed on the benignant figure of St. Francis, as if asking him if it were possible for him also to put away the pleasant sins and follies of the world, and lead a life like that which embalms the memory of that good man." "'If we don't go away tomorrow, we never shall, "'for this church will bewitch us and make it impossible to leave,' "'said Amanda, when at length they tore themselves away. "'I gave up trying to sketch cathedrals. "'It can't be done, and it seems impious to try,' "'said Matilda, quite exhausted by something deeper than pleasure. "'I think the reminiscences of a rook would make a capital story. "'They're long-lived birds and could tell tales of the past "'that would entirely eclipse our modern rubbish,' said Lavinia, "'taking a last look at the solemn towers "'and the shadowy birds that had haunted them for ages. "'The ladies agreed to be off early in the morning "'that they might reach Amboise in time for the eleven o'clock breakfast. "'Amanda was to pay the bill and to make certain inquiries at the office, "'Matt to fly out and do a trifle of shopping, "'while Lavinia packed up the bundles and mounted guard over them.' They separated, but in half an hour all met again, not in their room according to agreement, but before the cathedral, which had all decided not to revisit on any account. Matilda was there first, and as each of the others came stealing round the corner, she greeted them with a laugh, in which all joined after the first surprise was over. "'I told you it would be witch said Amanda, and then all took a farewell look, which lasted so long that they had to rush back to the hotel in most unseemly haste. "'Now to fresh chateaus and churches new,' sang Lavinia, as they rolled away on the fourth stage of their summer journey. A very short stage it was, and soon they were in an entirely new scene, for Amboise was a little old-time village on the banks of the Loire, looking as if it had been asleep for a hundred years. The Lyon d'Or was a quaint place, so like the inns described in French novels, that one kept expecting to see some of Dumas's heroes come dashing up all boots, plumes, and pistols, with a love letter for some court beauty in the castle on the hill beyond. Queer galleries and stairs led up outside the house to the rooms above. The salle à manger was across a court, and every dish came from a kitchen round the corner. The garçon, a beaming, ubiquitous creature, trotted perpetually, diving down steps, darting into dark corners, or skipping up ladders, "'producing needfuls from most unexpected places. "'The bread came up from the stable, soup from the cellar, "'coffee out of a meal chest, and napkins from the housetop, 
apparently for Adolf went up among the weathercocks to get them. No one knows us, no one can speak a word of English, and if we happen to die here it will ever be known. How romantic and nice it is, exclaimed Matt in good spirits, for the people treated the ladies as if they were duchesses in disguise, and the young women liked it. I'm not sure that the romance is all it looks. We should be in a sweet quandary if anything happened to our sheet anchor here. Just remember, in any danger, save Amanda first, and then she will save us. But if she's lost, all is lost, replied Lavinia darkly, for she always took tragical views of life when her bones ached. Up the hill they went after breakfast, and balm was found for the old lady's woes in the sight of many Angora cats, of great size and beauty. White as snow, with tails like plumes and mild yellow eyes, were these charmers. At every window sat one, on every doorstep sprawled a bunch of down, and frequently the eye of the tabby-loving spinster was gladdened by the touching spectacle of a blonde mamma in the bosom of her young family. "'If I could only carry it, I've had one of those dears, no matter what it cost,' cried Lavinia, more captivated by a live cat than by all the dead Huguenots that Catherine de Medici's hung over the castle walls on a certain memorable occasion. "'Well, you can't, so come on and improve your mind with some good, useful history,' said Amanda, leading them forward. "'You must remember that Charles the Seventh was born here in 1740, that Anne of Brittany married him for her first husband, and that he bumped his head against a low door in the garden here above, as he was running through to play bowls with his Anne, and it killed him. "'Which, the bump or the bowls?' asked Matt, who liked to have things clearly stated. "'Don't be frivolous, child.' Here, Margaret of Anjou and her son were reconciled to Warwick. Abd el Kader and his family were kept prisoners here, and in the garden is a tomb with a crescent on it, likewise a pleached walk, and a winding drive inside the great tower, up which lords and ladies used to ride straight into the hall, continued the sage Amanda, who yearned to enlighten the darkness of her careless friends. A brisk old woman did the honors of the castle, showing them moldy chapels, sepulchral halls, rickety stairs, grubby cells, and pitch-dark passages, till even the romantic Matilda was glad to see the light of day, and repose in the pleasant gardens while removing the cobwebs from her countenance and the dust from her raiment. A lovely view! Gladdened their eyes as they stood on the balcony, whence the amiable Catherine surveyed the walls hung thick, and the river choked up with the dead. Below, the broad Loire rolled slowly by between its green banks. Little boys, in the costume of Cupid, were riding great horses in to bathe after the day's work. The grey roofs of the town nestled to the hillside, and far away stretched the summer landscape, full of vague suggestions of new scenes and pleasures to the pilgrims. We start for Chenonceau's at seven in the morning. "'So, ladies, I beg that you will be ready punctually,' was the command issued by Amanda, as they went to their rooms, after a festive dinner of what Lavinia called earthworms and cacti, not being fond of stewed brains, baked eels, or thistles and pigweed chopped up in oil. Such a droll night as the wanderers spent, no locks on the doors and no bells, stairs leading straight up in the gallery from the courtyard, carts going and coming, soft footsteps stealing up and down, whispers that sounded suspicious, though they were only orders to kill chickens and pick salad for the morrow, and a ghostly whistle that disturbed Lavinia so much she at last draped herself in the green coverlet and went boldly forth upon the balcony to see what it meant. She intended to demand silence in French that would strike terror to the soul of the bravest native, but when she saw that poor dear hard-worked garçon blacking boots by the light of the moon, her heart melted with pity, and resolving to give him an extra fee, she silently returned to her stone-floored bower, and fell asleep in a stuffy little bed, whose orange curtains filled her dreams with volcanic eruptions and conflagrations of the most lurid description. At seven, an open carriage with a stout pair of horses and a sleepy driver rolled out of the courtyard of the Lyon d'Or. Within it sat three ladies, who gazed at one another with cheerful countenances, and surveyed the world with an air of bland content, beautiful to behold. "'I'm fairly faint with happiness,' sighed Matilda, as they drove through fields scarlet with poppies, starred with daisies, or yellow with buttercups, 
while birds piped gaily and trees wore their early green. "'You did not eat any breakfast. That accounts for it. Have a crust, do,' said Amanda, who seldom stirred without a good sweet crust or two, for they were easy to carry, wholesome to chew, and always ready at a moment's notice. "'Let us save our entusimusi till we get to the chateau, and enjoy this lovely drive in a peaceful manner,' said Lavinia, still a little sleepy after her adventures in the glimpses of the moon." So, for an hour or two, they rolled along the smooth road, luxuriating in the summer sights and sounds about them. The wayside cottages, with women working in the gardens, villages clustered round some tiny picturesque church, windmills whirling on the distant hilltops, vineyards full of peasants tying up the young vines, or trudging by with baskets on their backs, heaped with green cuttings for the goats at home. Old men, breaking stone by the roadside, touched their red caps to the pilgrims, jolly boys shouted at them from the cherry trees, and little children peeped from behind the rose bushes blooming everywhere. Soon glimpses of the winding share began to appear, then an avenue of stately trees, and then, standing directly in the river, rose the lovely chateau built for Diane de Poitiers by her royal lover. Leaving the carriage at the lodge, our sightseers crossed the moat, and, led by a wooden-faced girl with a lisp, entered the famous pleasure-house, which its present owner, a pensive man in black velvet who played fitfully on a French horn in a pepper-pot tower, is carefully restoring to its former splendor. The great picture-gallery was the chief attraction, and, beginning with Diane herself, a tall simpering baggage, with a bow, hounds, crescent, and a blue sash for drapery, they were led through a rapid review of all sorts of worthies and unworthies, relics and rubbish, without end. Portraits are always interesting. Even Lavinia, who had no soul for art, as Matt said, looked with real pleasure at a bas relief of Agnes of Sorel, and pictures of Montaigne, Rabelais, Ninon d'Enclos, Madame de Savagne, and miniatures of Lafayette and Ben Franklin. The latter gentleman looked rather out of place in such society, but perhaps his good old face preached the Dianes and Ninons a silent sermon. His plain suit certainly was a relief to the eye, wearied with periwigged sages and bejeweled sinners. Here was the little theatre where Rousseau's plays were acted. Here were the gilded chairs in which kings had sat, swords heroes had held, books philosophers had pored over, mirrors that had reflected famous beauties, and painted walls that looked down on royal revels long ago. The old kitchen had a fireplace big enough for a dozen cooks to have spoiled gallons of broth in, queer pots and pans, and a handy little window out of which they could fish at any moment, for the river ran below. The chapel, chambers, balconies, and terraces were all being repaired for, thanks to George Sand's grandmother, who owned the place in the time of the Revolution, it was spared out of respect to her, and is still a charming relic of the past. The ladies went down the mossy steps, leading from the gallery to the further shore, and lying under the oaks, whiled away the noontime by repeopling the spot with the shapes that used to inhabit it. A very happy hour it was, dreaming there by the little river, with the scent of new-mown hay in the fresh wind, and before them the airy towers and gables of the old chateau, rising from the stream like a vision of departed splendor, love, and romance. Having seen everything, and bought photographs ad libitum of the wooden-faced Lisper, who cheated awfully, the pilgrims drove away, satiated with relics, royalty, and regarde. Chapter Three, Part Two, of Shawl Straps: A Second Series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Shawl Straps: A Second Series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag, by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Three. France, Part Two. Another night in the stony-hearted, orange-colored rooms, with the sleepless garçon sweeping and murmuring outside like a banshee, 
while the hens roosted sociably in the gallery. The horses seemed to be champing directly under the bed, and the dead Huguenots bumping down upon the roof from the castle walls. Another curious meal wafted from the bowels of the earth and cooled by all the airs that blow. Then the shawl straps were girded anew, the carriage, a half-grown omnibus with the jaundice, mounted, the farewell bows and adieus received, and forth rumbled the duchesses en route for Blois. "'My heart is rent at leaving that lovely chateau,' said Matt, as they crossed the bridge. "'I mourn the earthworms, the cacti, and the tireless gossoon,' added Amanda, who appreciated French cookery and had enjoyed confidences with Adolph. "'The cats, the cats, the cats! I could die happy if I had one,' murmured Lavinia, and with these laments they left the town behind them. Anything hotter than Blois, with its half-dried-up river, dusty boulevards, and baked streets, can hardly be imagined. But these indomitable women did the church and the castle without flinching. The former was produced a failure, but the latter was entirely satisfactory. The emperor was having it restored in the most splendid manner. The interior seemed rather fresh and gay when contrasted with the time-worn exterior, but the stamped leathern hangings, tiled floors, emblazoned beams, and carved fireplaces were quite correct. Dragons and crowns, porcupines and salamanders, monograms and flowers, shone everywhere in a maze of scarlet and gold, brown and silver, purple and white. Here the historical Amanda revelled, and quenched the meek old guide with a burst of information, which caused him to stare humbly at the mad English. Regarde, my dears, the chamber and oratory of Catherine de Medici, who here plotted the death of the Duke de Guise. This is the cabinet of her son, Henry the Third, where he gave the daggers to the gentlemen who were to rid him of his enemy, the hero of the barricades. This is the salle de garde, where Guise was leaning on the chimney-piece when summoned to the king. This is the little room at the entrance of which he was set upon in the act of lifting the drapery, and stabbed with forty wounds. "'Oh, how horrid!' gasped Matilda, staring about as if she saw the sanguinary gentleman approaching. "'So interesting! Do go on!' cried Lavinia, who was fond of woe and enjoyed horrors. "'This is the hall where the body lay for two hours, covered with a cloak and a cross of straw on the breast.' cut in amanda as the guide opened his mouth here the king came to look upon the corpse of the once mighty henry le balafre and spurned it with his foot saying i shall not translate it for you matt je ne l'ai croyé pas assez grand and then ordered it to be burnt and the ashes cast into the river remember the date i implore you december twenty third fifteen eighty eight as Amanda paused for breath, the little man took the word and rattled off a jumble of facts and fictions about the window from which Marie de Medici lowered herself when imprisoned here by her dutiful son, Louis the Thirteenth. "'I wish the entire lot had been tossed out after her, for I do think kings and queens are a set of rascals!' cried Matt, scandalized by the royal iniquities to which she had been listening, till the hair stood erect upon her innocent head." The salle d'etat was being prepared for the trial of the men who had lately attempted the emperor's life, and a most theatrical display of justice was to be presented to the public. The richly carved staircase, with Francis I's salamanders squirming up and down it, was a relic worth seeing, but the parched pilgrims found the little pots of clotted cream quite as interesting, and much more refreshing, when they were served up at lunch, the pots, not the pilgrims each covered with a fresh vine-leaf and delicately flavoured with buttercups and clover. Amanda won the favour of the stately garçon by praising them warmly, and he kept bringing in fresh relays and urging her to eat a third, a fourth, with a persuasive dignity hard to resist. "'But yes, mademoiselle, one more, for nowhere else can creme de saint Gorfay be achieved.' They are desired, ardently desired, in Paris, but, alas, it is impossible to convey them so far, such is their exquisite delicacy. How many the appreciative ladies consumed, the muse saith not, but the susceptible heart of the great garçon was deeply touched, and it was with difficulty that they finally escaped from his attentions. 
On being presented with a cast-off camp-stool and a pair of old boots to dispose of, he instantly appropriated them as graceful souvenirs, and, clasping his hands, declared with effusion that he would seat his infant upon this so useful stool, and offer the charming boots to Madame, my wife, who would weep for joy at this touching tableau. With this melodramatic valedictory he suffered the guests to depart, and the last they saw of him he was still waving a dirty napkin as he stood at the gate, big, bland, and devoted to the end, though the drops stood thick upon his manly brow and the sun glared fiercely on his uncovered head. "'I shall write an article on Gersons when I get home,' said Lavinia, who was always planning great works and never executing them. "'We have known such a nice variety, and all have been so good to us that we owe them a tribute. You remember the dear tow-headed one at Morlaix, who insisted on handing us dishes of snails, and papers of pins with which to pick out the repulsive delicacy? Yes, and the gloomy one with the black linen sleeves who glowered at us, sighed gustily in our ears, and anointed us with gravy as he waited at the table, added Amanda. Don't forget the dark one with the languid Spanish eyes and curly hair on the boat going down the rats. How picturesque and polite he was, to be sure, as he kept picking up our beer bottles when they rolled about the deck, put in Matt, who had the dark youth safely in her sketchbook, with eyes as big and black as blots. The solemn one at Tours, who squirted seltzer water out of window at the beggars, without a smile, was very funny. So was the little one with grubby hands, who tottered under the big dishes, but insisted on carrying the heaviest. The fast trotter at Amboise won my heart. He was so supernaturally lively, and so full of hurried amiability. A very dear garçon, indeed. Be sure you remember the superb being at Brest, whose eyes threatened to fall out of his head at exciting moments. Also, Flabot's chubby boy, who adored Matt, and languished at her over the onions, like a cupid in a blue blouse. I will do justice to every one, and Lavinia took copious notes on the spot. Orleans was a prim, tidy town, and after taking a look at the fine statue of the maid, and laughing at some little funny soldiers drumming wildly in the place, our travellers went on to Bourges. This, now, is such a nice, dingy old place, and we will take our walks abroad directly, for it looks like rain, and we must make the most of our time and money, said Amanda for though on pleasure she was bent, she had a frugal mind. Forth they went as soon as dinner was over, and found the waters all abroad also, for every man was playing away with a hose, every woman scrubbing her doorsteps, and children gaily playing leapfrog in the puddles. "'Nasty damp place,' croaked the raven, obscuring her disgusted countenance behind the inevitable grey cloud, and gathering her garments about her, as they hopped painfully over the wet stones, for sidewalks there were none. I find it refreshing after the dust and heat. Please detach Matt from that shop window and come on, or we shall see nothing before dark, replied the ever amiable Amanda. Matilda would glue herself to every jeweller's window, and remain fascinated by the richness there displayed, till led away by force. On this occasion, however, her mania led to good results, for at the ninth window, as her keepers were about to drag her away, a ring of peculiar antiquity caught their eyes simultaneously, and, to Matt's amazement, both plunged into the little shop, clamoring to see it. A pale emerald, surrounded by diamond chippings set in silver, with a wide gold band cut in a leafy pattern, composed this gem of price. A Francis first ring, sold by a noble but impoverished family, and only a hundred francs, madame said the man, politely anxious to cheat the fair foreigners out of four times its value. "'Can't afford it,' and Lavinia retired. But the shrewd Amanda, with inimitable shrugs and pensive sighs, regretted that it was so costly. "'A sweet ring, but, alas, forty francs is all I have to give.' The man was desolated to think that eighty francs was the lowest he was permitted to receive. "'Would Madame call again, and perhaps it might be arranged?' "'Ah, no, madame is forced to depart early, to return no more. "'Mon Dieu, how afflicting! "'In that case sixty would be possible for so rare a relic. "'Madame is a beam, but it is not to be. Forty is the utmost, therefore merci and bonjour. "'Hold, where shall it be sent?' cries the man, giving in, "'but not confessing it with awkward frankness. "'A thousand thanks. Madame will pay for it at once.' 
and laying down the money, she sweetly bows herself away with the ring upon her finger. "'What a people!' ejaculated Lavinia, who always felt like a fly on a cobweb when she attempted to deal with the French in her blunt, confiding way. "'It is great fun,' answered Amanda, flashing her ring with satisfaction after the skirmish. "'Will Madame kindly direct me to the house of Jacques Cour?' she added, addressing an old woman clattering by in sabots. "'Allez toujours adroit en vous appuyant sur la gauche,' replied the native, beaming and bowing till the streamers of her cap waved in the wind. They followed these directions, but failed to find the place, and applied to another old woman eating soup on her doorstep. "'Suivez le chemin droit et tombant à gauche,' was the reply, with a wave of the spoon to all the points of the compass. "'Great heavens! What a language!' cried Lavinia who had been vainly endeavouring to support herself, as she fell in every direction over and into the full gutters. The house was found at last, an ancient mysterious place, with a very curious window, carved to look as if the shutters were half open, and from behind one peeped a man's head, from the other a woman's, both so lifelike that it quite startled the strangers. Murray informed the observers that these servants are supposed to be looking anxiously for their master's return. Jacques, having suddenly disappeared, after lending much money to the king, who took that medieval way of paying his debts. Service was being held in the church, and the ladies went in to rest and listen, for the music was fine. Much red and white drapery gave the sanctuary the appearance of a gay drawing-room, and the profane Lavinia compared the officiating clergy to a set of red furniture. The biggest priest was the sofa. Four deacons, the armchairs, and three little boys the footstools, all upholstered in crimson silk, and neatly covered with lace tidies. As if to rebuke her frivolity, a lovely, fresh voice from the hidden choir suddenly soared up like a lark, singing so wonderfully that a great stillness fell on the listeners, and while it lasted the tawdry church and its mummery were quite forgotten, as the ear led the heart up that ladder of sweet sounds to heaven. Even when the others joined in, one could still hear that child voice soaring and singing far above the rest, as if some little angel were playing with the echoes among the arches of the roof. A proud native informed strangers that it was a poor boy whose exquisite voice was the pride of the town, and would in time make his fortune. As the choir boys came racing down the stairs after service, pulling off their dingy robes as they ran, Lavinia tried to pick out the little angel, but gave it up in despair, for a more uninteresting set of bullet-headed, copper-colored sprigs she never saw. Rain drove the wanderers back to the hotel, and there they made a night of it. Ordering a fire in the largest of the three stuffy little cells which they occupied, they set about being comfortable, for it had turned chilly, and a furious wind disported itself in and out through numberless crevices. Lavinia was inspired to mull some wine, and brewed a mild jorum that cheered, but did not inebriate. Amanda produced her Shakespeare, and read aloud while the simmering and sipping went on. Matilda sketched the noble commander as she lay upon the sofa, with her Egyptian profile in fine relief, and her aristocratic red slippers gracefully visible. A large grey cat of a social turn joined the party, and added much to the domesticity of the scene by sitting on the hearth in a cosy bunch and purring blissfully. "'Now it is your turn to propose something for the general amusement, Mandy,' said Matt, when the beakers were drained dry and the Montagues and Capulets comfortably buried. "'Let us attend to the culture of our nails,' replied Amanda, producing her polissoir, powder, and knife. Three cups of tepid water were produced, and the company sat eagerly, soaking their fingertips for a time, after which much pruning and polishing went on, to the great bewilderment of Puss, who poked her own paws into the cups, as if trying to test the advantages of this remarkable American custom. "'What would our blessed mother say if she saw us now?' said Matt, proudly examining ten pointed pink nails at the tips of her long fingers. "'People told us we should get demoralized if we came abroad.' "'And this is the first step on the downward road,' returned Lavinia, shaking her head over her own backslidings. "'No, it's the second step. We eat calves' brains for dinner, and what I'm sure were frogs' legs with mushrooms. You know we vowed we wouldn't touch their horrid messes, but I really began to like them. 
confessed Matt, who had pronounced every dish at dinner delicious. Ha! I will write a poem, cried Amanda, and, leaping from the sofa, she grasped her pen, flung open her portfolio, and in a few brief moments produced these inspired stanzas. The Downward Road Two Yankee maids of simple mien and earnest high endeavor come sailing to the land of France to escape the winter weather. When first they reach that vicious shore, they scorn the native ways, refuse to eat the native grub or ride in native chaise. Oh, for the puddings of our home, or oh, for some simple food! These horrid, greasy, unknown things, how can you think them good? Thus to Amanda they did say, an uncomplaining maid, who ate in peace and answered not, until one day they said, How can you eat this garbage vile against all nature's laws? How can you eat your nails and points until they look like claws? Then patiently Amanda said, My loves, just wait a while. The time will come you will not think the nails are victuals vile. A month has passed, and now we see that prophecy fulfilled. The ardor of those carping maids is most completely chilled. Matilda was the first to fall, lured by the dark gossoon. In awful dishes one by one she dipped her timid spoon. She promised for one little week to let her nails grow long, but added in a saving clause she thought it very wrong. Thus did she take the fatal plunge, did compromise with sin. Then all was lost from that day forth, French ways were sure to win. Lavinia followed in her train and ran the self-same road, ate sweetbread first, then chopped up brains, eels, mushrooms, pickled toad. She cries, how flat the home cuisine after this luscious food. Puddings and brittle joints of meat that once was fancied good. And now in all their leisure hours, one resource never fails. Morning and noon and night they sit and polish up their nails. Then if one short, fatal month, a change like this appears, oh, what will be the next result when they have stayed for years? Tremendous applause greeted this masterly effort, and other poems were produced with the rapidity of genius by Amanda and Lavinia, each writing the alternate verse, A la Beaumont and Fletcher, which gave a peculiar charm to these effusions. When Matilda was called upon for a festive suggestion, she promptly replied with a graceful yawn, Let's go to bed. The meeting, therefore, broke up, and the younger ladies returned to their cells in good order. But the raven, excited by the jocund hour, continued to rustle and patter about the warm room in a state of inexpressible hilarity, most exasperating to the others who desired to sleep. Not content with upsetting the fire-irons occasionally, singing to the cat, and slamming the furniture about, this restless bird kept appearing first at one cell door with a conundrum, then at the other with a joke, or insisted on telling funny stories in her den, till the exhausted victims implored her to take an opium pill and subside before they became furious. She obeyed, and, after a few relapses into wandering and joking, finally slumbered. Then occurred the one thrilling adventure of this happy journey. In the darkest hour before dawn, Matt awoke, heard a suspicious noise in the middle room, and asked if Lavinia was on the rampage again. No reply, and listening, a low, rasping, rustling sound was heard. Thieves, of course. Our watches and purses are on the table, and Lavinia has probably forgotten to lock the door. I must attend to this and up rose the dauntless Matilda, who feared neither man nor ghost. Grasping her dagger, hitherto used as a paper-cutter, but always eager to be steeped in the gore of gowns, robbers, or beasts of prey, she crept to the door and peeped in. The pale glow of the fire showed her a dark figure crouching in the opposite doorway. The click of a pistol caught her ear, but dodging quickly, the heroic girl cried sternly from the shelter of Lavinia's bed-curtain, "'Come out, or I'll fire!' Mio Dio, is it only you? answered a familiar voice, as Amanda, shrouded in a waterproof, sprang up and lit a match. What are you prowling about for? demanded Matt. To blow your brains out, apparently, answered Mandy, lowering her arms. Why are you abroad? To stab you, I fancy, and Matt sheathed her dagger, balked of its prey. I heard a noise. So did I. Let's see what it is. 
and, lighting a candle, the fair Amazons looked boldly about the shadowy room. Lavinia lay wrapped in slumber, with only the end of her sarcastic nose visible beyond the misty cloud that enveloped her venerable countenance. The outer door was fast, and the shutters closed. No booted feet appeared below the curtains. No living eyes rolled awfully in the portrait of the salmon-colored saint upon the wall. Yet the rustling and rasping went on, and with one impulse the defenders of sleeping innocence made for the table in the corner. There was the midnight robber at his fell work, the big cat peacefully gnawing the cold chicken, and knocking about the treasured crusts dragged from the luncheon basket, carefully packed for an early start. "'Wake and behold the ruin your pet has made! We might be murdered or carried off a dozen times over without her knowing it. Here's a nice duenna!' and the indignant ladies shook, pinched, and shouted, till the hapless sleeper opened one eye and wrathfully demanded what the matter was. They told her with eloquent brevity, but instead of praising their prowess and thanking them with fervor, the ungrateful woman shut her eye again, merely saying, with drowsy irascibility, "'You told me to go to sleep, and I went. Next time fight it out among yourselves, but don't wake me.' "'Throw the cat out of the window and go to bed, Matt,' and Amanda uncocked her pistol with the resignation of one who had learned not to expect gratitude in this world. "'Catch a hair of that dear creature, and I'll raise the house,' cried Lavinia, roused at once. Puss, who had viewed the phrase sitting bolt upright on the table, now settled the vexed question by skipping into Lavinia's arms, feeling with the instinct of her race that her surest refuge was there. Matt retired in silent disgust, and the raven fell asleep, soothed by the grateful purring of her furry friend. "'Last night's experiences have given me a longing for adventures,' said Matt, as they journeyed on next morning. "'I have had quite enough of that sort,' growled Lavinia. "'Let us read our papers and wait for time to send us something in the way of a lark,' and Amanda obscured herself in a grove of damp newspapers." Lavinia also took one, and read bits aloud to Matt, who was mending her gloves, bright yellow, four-buttoned, and very dirty. "'Translate as you go along. I do so hate that gabble,' begged Matt, who would not improve her mind. So Lavinia gave her a free translation, which convulsed Amanda behind her paper. Coming to this passage, "'Plusieurs fait graves sont arrivés,' the reader rendered it, "'Several made graves have arrived,' adding, Dear me, what singular customs the French have, to be sure. A little farther on she read, Un portrait défu monsieur mon père, adding, A fire portrait means a poker sketch, I suppose. Here a smothered giggle from Amanda caused the old lady to say, Bless you, thinking the dear girl had sneezed. I must have some blue cotton to mend my dress with. Remind me to get some wet moulin. By the way, how do you ask for it in French? said Matt, surveying a rent in her skirts. "'Oh, you just go in and say, "'Avez-vous un fils bleu?' replied Lavinia, with a superior air. "'A blue sun! My precious granny, what will you say next?' murmured Amanda, faint with suppressed laughter. "'What are you muttering about?' asked Granny sharply. "'Trying to recall those fine lines in Wilhelm Meister, don't you remember? "'We're nissim brod mit fernen as,' replied Amanda." polite even at the last gasp. "'I read my goatee in decent English, and don't know anything but training asses,' returned Lavinia severely. "'That was too much. Amanda cast her paper down and had her laugh out, as the only means of saving herself from suffocation. The others gazed upon her in blank amazement, till she found breath enough to enlighten them, and when such peals of merriment arose that the guard popped his head in to see if he had not unwittingly shipped a load of lunatics. That was splendid, but now we must sober down, for a gorgeous being is about to get in, said Amanda as they stopped at a station. The gorgeous being entered and found three demure ladies wrapped in newspapers. They apparently saw nothing but the words before them, yet every one of them knew that the handsome young man had bowed in the most superior manner. Also that he was dressed in brown velvet, long gaiters, buttoned to the knee, a ravishing blue tie, buff gloves, and pouch and powder horns slung over his shoulder. Also that a servant with two dogs and a gun had touched his hat and said, Oui, monsieur le comte, as he set the door. A slight thrill pervaded the statues as this fact was made known, and each began to wonder how the elegant aristocrat would behave. 
To say that he stared feebly expresses the fixity of his noble gaze, as it rested in turn upon the three faces opposite. When satisfied, he also produced a paper and began to read. But Matilda caught a big black eye peering over the sheet more than once, as she peered over the top of her own. "'I don't like him. Remember, we don't speak French,' whispered the discreet Amanda. "'I can swear that I don't,' said Lavinia, with an irrepressible smile, as she remembered the blue sun. "'The language of the eye is not forbidden me, and I can't sit baking under a newspaper all the way,' returned Matilda, whose blonde curls had evidently met with the great creature's approval. A slight pucker about the compt slips caused a thrill of horror to pervade the ladies, as Amanda murmured under her breath, "'He may understand English.' "'Then we are lost,' returned the tragic raven. "'Wish he did. I really pine for a little attention. It gives such a relish to life,' said Matilda, thinking regretfully of the devoted beings left behind. The prudent Amanda and the stern Lavinia steeled their hearts, and iced their countenances to the comely gentleman. But the social Matilda could not refrain from responding to his polite advances, with a modest, Merci, monsieur, as he drew the curtain for her, a smile when he picked up the unruly curling stick, and her best bow as he offered his paper with a soft glance of the black eyes. In vain Amanda tried to appall her with awful frowns. In vain Lavinia trod warningly upon her foot. She paid no heed, and left them no hope but the saving remembrance that she couldn't talk French. "'If the man don't get out soon, I'll tie her up in my shawl and tell him she's mad,' resolved Lavinia, whose spinster soul was always scandalized at the faintest approach to a flirtation. "'If the man does speak English, Matt will have it all over her own way,' thought Amanda, remembering the vow imposed upon the reckless girl. "'Alas, alas, for the anxious twain!' The man did not get out soon. The man did speak English, and in ten minutes Matilda was off like a colt without a halter. The anguish of her keepers added zest to the fun, and finding that the gentleman evidently thought her the lady of the party, owing to the yellow gloves, smartest hat, and irreproachable boots, and the others in sober grey and black were made in duenna, this reprehensible girl kept up the joke, put on airs, and enjoyed that flirtatious hour to her heart's content. As if to punish the others for their distrust, and to reward Matt's interest in him, Monsieur Le Comte devoted himself to Mademoiselle, telling her about his hunting, his estate, and finished by inviting her and her party to call and view his chateau, if they ever passed at the town, which had the honour of being his summer residence. Matt responded to all these courtesies with confiding sweetness, and when at length he was desolated at being obliged to tear himself away, she gave sigh for sigh as he retired with a superb bow, a gallant bon voyage, madame, and a wicked twinkle of the black eyes as they rested on the faces of the frozen ladies. "'I got rather the best of the joke in that little affair, didn't I?' said Matt, gaily, as the brown velvet idleness vanished. "'You are a disgrace to your party and your nation,' sternly responded Amanda. Lavinia spoke not, but shook her little sister till the hat flew off her head, and she had only breath enough left to declare with unquenched ardor that she would do it again the very next chance she got. Lectures, laughter, and longings for my comte beguiled the remainder of the way, and Moulin, as Matt pronounced Moulin, was reached after a pleasant trip through a green country, picturesque with the white cattle of Berry. There was not much to see, but the town was so quaint and quiet that Amanda was seized with one of her remarkable projects. Let us find a little house somewhere and stay a week or two. I fain would rest and ruminate among the white cows for a while, have a little washing done, and slowly prepare to emerge into the world again. Lyons is our next point, and there we must bid adieu to freedom and shawl straps. Very well, dear, responded Lavinia with resignation, having learned that the best way to curb these aberrations of genius was to give in and let circumstances prove their impracticability. So Amanda inquired of the landlady if such a rustic cot could be found, whereupon the dingy little woman clasped her dingy little hands and declared that she had exactly the charming retreat desired. Truly, yes, and she would at once make her toilet, order out the carriage, and display this lovely villa to the dear ladies. With many misgivings, 
the three squeezed themselves into a square clothes basket on wheels drawn by an immense bony white horse driven by a striped boy and adorned by madame in a towering bonnet laden with amazing fruit flowers and vegetables lavinia counted three tomatoes a bunch of grapes poppies and pansies wheat ears and blackberry vines a red red rose and one small lettuce with glass dewdrops and green grubs lavishly sprinkled over it a truly superb chapeau and a memorable one away they trundled through the stony streets dusty roads waste grounds marshy meadows and tumbled down pleasure gardens till the clothes basket turned down a lane and the bony horse stopped at length before a door in a high red wall behold cried madame leading them with much clanking of keys into a cabbage garden a small tool house stood among the garden stuff with brick floors very dirty windows and the atmosphere of a tomb bags of seed wheelbarrows onions and dust cumbered the ground empty bottles stood on the old table cigar ends lay thick upon the hearth and a trifle of gay crockery adorned the mantelpiece season here is a salon so cool so calm above is a room with beds and around the garden where the ladies can sit all day a maid can achieve the breakfast here and my carriage can come for them to dine at the hotel is it not charmingly arranged it is simply awful said matt aghast at the prospect settle it as you like dear only i'm afraid i couldn't stay very long on account of the dampness observed lavinia cheerfully as she put a hoe handle under her feet and wiped the blue mould from a three-legged chair it won't do i'll tell her you're an invalid and very particular said amanda with another inspiration as she led the landlady forth to break the blow tenderly my neuralgia is useful if it is an ornamental and what a comfort that is said lavinia as she lightly threw a large cockroach out of a window dodged a wasp and crushed a fat spider and so it was in many ways if the party wanted a car to themselves granny was ordered to lie down and groan dismally which caused other travellers to shun the poor invalid if rooms did not suit suffering madame must have sun or perish late lunches easy carriages extra blankets every sort of comfort was for her whether she wanted them or not shall i be sick or well was always the first question when an invitation came for my sister's delicate health was the standing excuse when parties palled or best gowns were not get edible while amanda conferred with the hostess among the cabbages matt discovered that the picturesque white cattle in the field close by were extremely fierce and unsocial that there was no house in sight and the venerable horse and shay would never sustain many trips to and fro dinnered at the hotel lavinia poked about the house and soon satisfied herself that it abounded in every species of what fanny kemble calls entomological inconvenience and an atmosphere admirably calculated to introduce cholera to the inhabitants of Moulin. it is all settled let us return said amanda appearing at last with an air of triumph having appeased the old lady by eating green currants and admiring an earwig at arbor commanding a fine view of a marsh where frogs were piping and cool mists rising as the sun set the chickens were tough at dinner the wine bitter the bread sour but no one reproached amanda as the cause of this change and when the hostess bowed them out next day without a smile they drove away conscious only of deep gratitude that they were saved from leaving their bones to moulder among the cabbages of Moulin. now we return to civilization good clothes and christian food said lavinia as they surveyed their fine rooms at the grand hotel lyons likewise letters and luggage added amanda as the maid brought in a bundle of letters and two porters came bumping up with the trunks well i've enjoyed the trip immensely though nothing very remarkable has happened said matt diving into her private ark with satisfaction i should like to wander in the wilderness for years if i could hear from my family at intervals said lavinia briskly breaking open the plump travel-worn letters then you consider our trip a success asked amanda pausing in the act of removing the dust from her noble countenance a perfect success we've done what we planned had no mishaps seen and enjoyed much quarrelled not at all laughed a great deal and been altogether festive thanks to you i shall hang my shawl strap on the castle wall as a trophy of the prowess of my amanda and the success of the last declaration of american independence replied lavinia i also said matt opening her bundle for the one hundredth and last time you do me proud i humbly thank you 
and with a superb curtsey the commander-in-chief modestly retired behind the towel. Chapter 4 of Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 4. Switzerland My children, listen to the words of wisdom, ere it is too late, began Lavinia, as the three sat about in dressing gowns after a busy day in Geneva. We listen. Go on, Granny, replied the irreverent girls. If we stay here a week longer, we are ruined. Firstly, this metropole is an expensive hotel also noisy and full of fashionable people, whom I hate. Secondly, the allurements of the jeweler shops are too much for us, and we had better flee before we spend all our money. Thirdly, if war does break out along the Rhine, as rumor now predicts, Geneva will be crammed with people whose plans, like ours, are upset. Therefore, we had better skip across the lake, and secure a comfortable place for ourselves at Vevey or Montreux, for we shall probably have to winter there. Here, here, we will do it, and if Italy doesn't get over her revolution in time for us to go to Rome, we must content ourselves with some nook in this refuge for all wanderers on the face of the continent, said Amanda. But I like Geneva so much, it's such fun to watch the splendid waiters file in at dinner, looking like young gentlemen ready for a ball. The house is so gay, and the shops. Never did I dream of such richness before. Do stay another week and buy a few more things, prayed Matilda, who spent most of her time gloating over the jewelry and tempting her sister to buy all manner of useless gods. No, we will go to-morrow. I know of several good pensions at Vevey, so we are sure of getting in somewhere. Pack at once and let us flee, returned Lavinia, who, having bought a watch, a ring, and a locket, felt that it was time to go. And go they did, settling for a month at Bex, a little town up the valley of the Rhone, remarkable for its heat, its dirt, its lovely scenery, and the remarkable perfection to which its inhabitants had brought the goitre, nearly every one being blessed with an unsightly bunch upon the neck, which they decorated with ribbons and proudly displayed to the disgusted traveller. Here, in the rambling old Hôtel des Bains, with its balconies, gardens, and little rooms, the wanderers reposed for a time. A Polish countess with her lover, daughter, and governess conferred distinction upon the house an old hungarian count who labored under the delusion that he descended in a direct line from zenobia also adorned the scene an artist with two pretty boys named alfred constable landseer reynolds and alston west coip van dyke afforded matilda much satisfaction English mammas with prim daughters of thirty or so, still tied to their apron strings, were to be found, of course, for they are everywhere, also wandering French folk raving about the war one minute and tearing their hair over bad coffee the next. Amanda read newspapers and talked politics with the old count, while Lavinia, with a paper bag of apricots under one arm, and a volume of Disraeli's novels under the other, spent her shining hours wandering from balcony to garden, enjoying the heat, which gave her a short respite from her woes. While here Matilda, in company with a kindred soul, made the ascent of Mount St. Bernard, with the pleasing accompaniments of wind, rain, thunder, and lightning. 
but the irrepressible americans went on in spite of warnings from more prudent travellers who stopped halfway with one mule and a guide for escort the two enthusiasts waded swollen streams with ice-cold water up to their knees climbed slippery roads faced what seemed a whirlwind at that height and undaunted by the uproar of the elements pressed on to the hospice to the great admiration of moritz the guide who told them he had seldom taken men up in such a storm never ladies at the hospice the dripping lasses found a hospitable welcome from the handsome monk who does the honours there being provided with dry garments and having much fun over the tall matilda draped in skirts of many colours in the attempt to get any long enough they were fed and warmed by the engaging monk who entertained them as they sat about a roaring fire while the storm raged without with thrilling tales of the travellers they had saved the wild adventures they had known in the dreadful winter time and the gifts bestowed upon them by grateful travellers or generous guests the prince of wales had sent them a piano and many fine pictures ornamented the walls from famous persons an old english lady who spends her summers up there seemed much amused at the prank of the girls and evidently wondered what their guardians were about a merry and memorable evening and when on going to their cells they found the beds nicely warmed matilda exclaimed this is the most delightful of the romantic and the comfortable i ever saw alps and warming pans taken gently are delicious at five next morning they were awakened by the chanting of the invisible brotherhood and went down to the chapel for mass on going out for a clamour on the rocks seven or eight great dogs came baying and leaping about them licking their hands and smelling their garments to see if they were hurt looking into their bright benevolent eyes one could well believe the wonderful tales told of their courage and sagacity though so powerful and large they were gentle as kittens and the dog-loving girls were proud to receive and return the caresses of these four-footed heroes leaving a grateful souvenir in the box intended to receive whatever guests choose to leave the girls descended in the morning sunshine finding it a very different experience from the ascent all was clear and calm now beautiful and grand and only pausing at m to send back a fine engraving to the comely priest who had made a deep impression on their romantic hearts the enfants returned to their anxious friends mildewed rumpled and weary but full of enthusiastic delight over their successful ascent of st bernard war broke out and alexander the all-accomplished head waiter dropped his napkin shouldered his gun and marched away leaving the hotel des bains desolate being pretty thoroughly baked and very weary of the little town our trio departed to vevey and settled down in the best pension that ever received the weary traveller standing in its own pretty grounds and looking out upon the lake pension paradis deserves its name clean and cosy within a good table a kindly hostess and the jolliest old host ever seen what more could the human heart desire vevey was swarming with refugees don carlos or the duke de madrid as he was called was there with his duchess and court plotting heaven knows what up at his villa with the grave shabby men who haunted the town queen isabella reigned at one hotel and spanish grandees pervaded the place there were several at pension paradis and no one guessed what great creatures they were till a fete day arrived and the grim grey men blossomed out into counts marquises and generals covered with orders stars and crosses splendid to behold one particularly silent shabby little man with a shaven head and fine black eyes who was never seen to smile became an object of interest on that occasion 
by appearing in a gorgeous uniform with a great gilt grasshopper hanging down his back from a broad green ribbon who was he what did the grasshopper mean where did he go to in a fine carriage and what was he plotting with the other carlists who dodged in and out of his room at all hours no one ever knew and all the artful questions put to the young spaniard who played croquet with the girls were unavailing nothing was discovered except that little mirandola had a title and might be sent back to spain any day to lose his life or liberty in some rash plot which circumstance made the black-eyed boy doubly interesting to the free-born americans lavinia bewailed his hard lot amanda taught him whist and told his fortune and matilda put him in her sketch-book done in the blackest india ink it is also to be recorded that the doomed little don was never seen to laugh but once and that was when the girls taught him the classical game of muggins the name struck him he went about saying it to himself and on the first occasion of his being mugginsed he was so tickled that he indulged in a hearty boy's laugh but immediately recovered himself and never smiled again as if in penance for so forgetting his dignity a bashful russian who wore remarkably fine broadcloth and had perfect manners was likewise received into the good graces of the ladies who taught him english called him the baron in private and covered him with confusion in public by making him talk at table but the most amusing of all the family was madame a a handsome widow from lyon with two ugly children and a stout old mamma who wore orange stockings and a curious edifice of black lace encircled with large purple asters the widow had married an italian artist who was mortally jealous of his wife whose blonde beauty attracted much attention at rome in some quarrel with a model the husband was stabbed and the handsome widow left in peace a tall fair lady with a profile like marie antoinette she dressed in white with violet ribbons and wore much ancient jewelry a loud-voiced energetic woman who bewailed the sack of her house at lyons scolded her children and cursed the germans with equal volubility and spirit when silent she was the picture of a patrician beauty but alas her voice destroyed the charm and her manners great heavens what things that woman did picking her pearly teeth with a hairpin and knocking her darlings into their chairs with one sweep of her elbow when they annoyed her at table were the least of the horrors she perpetrated but she talked well devoted herself to her family and took misfortune bravely so much may be pardoned her her infants were only remarkable for their ugliness and curious costumes the little girl usually wore soiled silk gowns and had her hair tied up with bits of twine the boy appeared in a suit of yellow calico spotted with black looking very much like a canary bird who had fallen into an inkstand on festival occasions he wore white cloth raiment with red ribbons stuck here and there and high red boots but on the whole the old mamma was the queerest of the set for she spent most of her time lumbering up and down stairs which amusement kept the orange hose constantly before the public when not disporting herself in this way she dozed in the salon or consumed much food at table with a devotion that caused her to suck her fingers on every one of which shone an antique ring of price her headgear was a perpetual puzzle to the observing lavinia who could never discover whether it was a cap a bonnet or a natural production for it was never off madame walked out in it wore it all day and very likely slept in it at least lavinia firmly believed so and often beguiled the watches of the night imagining the old soul placidly slumbering with the perennial asters encircling her aged brow like a halo 
one other party there was who much amused the rest of the household an american lady with a sickly daughter who would have been pretty but for her affectation and sentimentality the girl was engaged to a fierce dissipated little russian who presented her with a big bouquet every morning followed her about all day like a dog and glared wrathfully at any man who cast an eye upon the languishing damsel in white muslin and flowing curls bedropped with pearls as a romantic lady expressed it it was evident that the russian without any vows in his name was going to marry mademoiselle for her money and the weak mamma was full of satisfaction at the prospect to others it seemed a doubtful bargain and much pity was felt for the feeble girl doomed to go to russia with a husband who had tyrant written in every line of his bad blasé little face and figure french polish could not hide the brute nor any quantity of flowers conceal the chain by which he was leading his new serf away to bondage in st petersburg into the midst of this select society came a countryman of our three a jocund youth fresh from algiers with relics adventures and tales that utterly eclipsed the arabian nights festive times followed for the peri the pet name of aforesaid youth gave them the fruits of his long wanderings sung whole operas heard in paris danced ballets seen in berlin recounted perils among the moors served up gossip from the four corners of the globe and conversed with each member of the household in his or her own language a cheerful comrade was the peri and a great addition to the party who now spent most of their time sitting about the town eating grapes and listening to the pranks of this sprightly m d who seemed to be studying his profession by wandering over europe with a guitar a la troubadour sounding the lungs of a veiled princess in morocco was the least of his adventures and the treasures he had collected supplied lavinia with materials for unlimited romances cuff buttons made from bits of marble picked up among the ruins of carthage diamond crescents and earrings bought in toledo so antique and splendid that relic-loving amanda raved about them photographs of the bells of constantinople moorish coins and pipes bits of curious indian embroidery and best of all the power of telling how each thing was found in so graphic a manner that eastern bazaars ruins and palaces seemed to rise before the listeners as in the time of the magic story-tellers but all too soon he packed his knapsack and promising to bring each of his friends the nose or ear of one of the shattered saints from the great cathedral at strasbourg the peri vanished from paradise and left them all lamenting the little flurry in italy ending peacefully our travellers after much discussion resolved to cross the alps and spend the winter in rome if possible so with tragic farewells from those they left behind them who hoping to keep them longer predicted all manner of misfortunes the three strong-minded ladies rumbled away in the coupe of a diligence to brieg a lovely day's journey up the valley of the rhone and a short night's rest in the queer little town at the foot of the mountains before light the next morning they were called and after a hurried breakfast in a stony hall went shivering out into the darkness and stumbling through the narrow street came to the starting point lanterns were dancing about the square two great diligences loomed up before them horses were tramping men shouting and eager travellers scrambling for places in the dimly lighted office people were clamouring for tickets scolding at the delay or grimly biding their time in corners with one eye asleep and the other sharply watching the conductor isn't it romantic cried matilda wide awake and in a twitter of excitement it is frightfully cold and i don't see how we are going for both these caravans are brimful 
croaked lavinia chafing her purple nose and wishing it had occurred to her to buy a muff before going to sunny italy i have got through tickets and someone is bound to see us over these snowbanks so trust in providence and the other man and we shall come out right i assure you replied the energetic amanda who had conferred with a spectral being in the darkness and blindly put her faith in him away lumbered one diligence after the other the first drawn by seven horses the second by five while the carrier's little cart with one brought up the rear but still three muffled ladies sat upon a cool stone in the dark square waiting for the spectre to keep his promise he did like a man for suddenly the doors of an old stable flew open and out rattled a comfortable carriage with a pair of stout little horses jingling their bells and a brisk driver whose voice was pleasant as he touched his hat and invited the ladies to enter assuring them that they would soon overtake and pass the heavy diligences before them never again will i doubt you my amanda cried the raven packing herself into the dowager's corner with a grateful heart i hope the top of this carriage opens for i must see everything cried matilda prancing about on the front seat in a chaos of wraps books bottles and lunch baskets of course it does and when there is anything to see we will see it it is dark and cold now so we'd better all go to sleep again with which sage remark amanda burrowed into her cloaks and slumbered but not the other two matilda stuck her head out of one window uttering little cries of wonder and delight at all she saw while livy watched the solemn stars pale one by one as the sky brightened and felt as if she were climbing up out of a dark valley of weariness and pain into a new world full of grand repose slowly winding higher and higher through the damp pine forest softly stirring in the morning wind they saw the sky warm from its cold gray to a rosy glow making ready for the sun to rise as they never saw it rise before full many a glorious morning have i seen flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye but never more wonderfully than on that day long after the distant peaks flamed in the ruddy light they rode in shadow but turning suddenly round a corner the sun came dazzling through a great gorge startling them with the splendor it brought down went the carriage top and standing bolt upright three pairs of eager eyes drank in the grandeur and the beauty that makes the crossing of the simplon an experience to live for ever in the memory peak after peak of the bernese oberland rose behind them silver white against a wonderful blue sky before them monte rosa touched with the morning red and all around great glaciers glittering in the sunshine awful gorges with torrents thundering from the heights above relics of landslides and avalanches still visible in uprooted trees boulders tumbled here and there and ruins of shepherds huts in solitary nooks where sheep now feed the road crept in and out over frail bridges spanning chasms that made one dizzy to look into through tunnels of solid rock or galleries with windows over which poured waterfalls from the treacherous glaciers above this road is a miracle in itself for all nature seems to protest against it and the elements never tire of trying to destroy it only a napoleon would have had the audacity to dream of such a path and it is truly a royal road into a lovely land passing the diligences the little carriage went rapidly on and soon the three were almost alone out leaped lavinia and matilda and walked along the level way that curved round a great gorge go on and let me be it is all so magnificent it almost takes my breath away i must just sit a minute like a passive bucket and let it pour into me said lavinia in a solemn tone 
Matt understood, for her own heart and soul were full, and with a silent kiss of sympathy, walked on, leaving her sister to enjoy that early mass in a grander cathedral than any built with hands. In spite of the sunshine, it was very cold, and when the three met again, their noses looked like the eldest Miss Pecksniff's, as if Aurora had nipped and tweaked it with her rosy fingers. Subsiding into their places with pale, excited faces, they went silently on for a long time, with no sound but the chime of the bells on the horses, who were covered with a light hoar-frost. Wrapped up to their eyes like Egyptian women sat Livy and Amanda, while Matilda, having tried to sketch Monte Rosa and given it up, made a capital caricature of them as they ate cold chicken and drank wine in a primitive manner out of the bottle. It was a sudden descent from the sublime to the ridiculous, but the feeble human mind cannot bear too much glory at once, and is saved by the claims of the prosaic body, that will get tired and hungry even atop of the everlasting hills. So the enthusiasts picked their chicken bones, sipped their wine, and felt less exhausted and hysterical. A good laugh over the carrier's little boy, who sniffed the banquet afar off, and came running to offer a handful of pale alpine flowers, with wistful glances at the lunch, did them more good still. For the little chap caught and bolted the morsels they gave him with such dexterous rapidity it was as good as juggling. Refuges and the hospice came in sight one after the other, and while waiting to change horses, one had time to wonder how the people living there managed to be such a stolid, dirty, thriftless-looking set. Mountaineers should be intelligent, active, and hardy, but these men were a most ungainly crew, and Lavinia's theories got a sad blow. A bad dinner at Simplon would have been an affliction at any other time, but with the Valley of Gondo for dessert, no one cared for other food. Following the wild stream that had worn its way between the immense cliffs, they drove rapidly down towards Italy, feeling that this was a fit gateway to the promised land. At Isel, on the frontier, they enacted a little farce for the benefit of the custom house officers. Lavinia and Amanda had old passports, and had been told they would be needed. Matt had none, so she was ordered to try the role of maid. Before they arrived, she took out her earrings, tied up her curls under a dingy veil, put on a waterproof, and tried to assume the demure air of an Abigail. When they alighted, she was left to guard the wraps in the carriage, while the others went with the luggage, expecting to have much trouble, for all manner of hindrances had been predicted owing to the unsettled state of the country. Nothing could be simpler, however. No passports were demanded, a very careless search of luggage, and it was all over. So Matilda threw off her disguise and ascended the diligence in her own character, for here, alas, they left the cosy little carriage with the affable driver and the jingling bells. Only two places could be found in the crowded diligences, and great was the fuss till Amanda was invited up aloft by a friendly gentleman who had a perch behind, large enough for two. There they discussed theology and politics to their heart's content, and at parting the worthy man cut his book in two and gave Amanda half that she might refresh herself with a portion of some delightfully dry work on druidical remains, protoplasm, or the state of the church before the flood. The force of contrast makes the charm of this entry into Italy, for, after the grandeur of the Alps and the gloomy wildness of Gondo, the smiling scene is doubly lovely, as one drives down to Domo da Sola. Weariness, hunger, and sleep were quite forgotten, and when our travellers came to Lago Maggiore, glimmering in the moonlight, they could only sigh for happiness and look and look and look. Victory has perched upon our banners so far, 
i am sure for never was a trip more delightful it is not every stranger who is fortunate enough to see sunrise noonday sunset and moonlight in crossing the alps said matilda as she fell into her bed quite exhausted by the excitement of the day i feel a richer better woman for it and don't believe i shall ever see anything more satisfactory if i stay in italy ten years responded lavinia wrapping the red army blanket like a martial cloak around her wait till the spell of rome is upon you and then see what you will feel my granny predicted amanda who had felt the spell and had not yet escaped from it don't believe it will suit me half so well persisted livy who would prefer nature to art much to amanda's disgust we shall see observed amanda with the exasperating mildness of superior Section 7 of Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag, by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 5, Part 1. Italy sleep as deep dreamless and refreshing as if the beneficent spirit of carlo borromeo still haunted the enchanted lake prepared the three for a day of calm delights the morning was spent floating over the lake in a luxuriously cushioned boat with a gay awning and a picturesque rower to visit isola bella everyone knows what a little paradise has been made to blossom on that rock so raptures over the flowers the marbles the panniers of lovely fruit and the dirty pretty children who offered them are unnecessary in the afternoon having dispatched the luggage to florence our travellers sailed away to luini catching last glimpses of monte rosa and enjoying the glories of an italian sunset on an italian lake at luini the girls caused much excitement by insisting on sitting up with the driver instead of sharing the coupe with their decorous duenna we must see the lovely views and the moonlight said amanda and up she went to sit aloft with a brigandish driver dressed in a scarlet and black uniform with a curly horn slung over his shoulder and to go tearing up hill and down with four frisky horses is irresistible and up skipped matilda you will both catch your death of cold if you don't break your necks so it will be well to have someone to nurse or bury you and lavinia finding commands and entreaties vain entered the coupe with mournful dignity with a toot of the horn and cheers from the crowd which the girls gracefully acknowledged away rumbled the diligence with at least two very happy occupants how lovely it was first the soft twilight wrapping everything in mysterious shadow and then the slow uprising of a glorious full moon touching the commonest object with its magical light cries of rapture from the girls atop were answered by exclamations from livy hanging half out of the coupe regardless of night air or wraps on the head from overhanging boughs as they went climbing up woody hills or dashing down steep roads that wound so sharply round corners it was a wonder the airy passengers did not fly off at every lurch rattling into quiet little towns with the grand tootle too of the horn was an especial delight and to see the people gather so quickly that they seemed to spring from the ground a moment's chatter a drink for the horses a soft felice note another toot and away thundered the diligence for miles more of moonlight summer air and the ecstasy of rapid motion what that dear brown driver with the red vest 
the bobtailed buttony coat and the big yellow tassels dancing from his hat brim thought of those two american damsels we shall never know but it may be imagined that after his first bewilderment he enjoyed himself for amanda aired her italian and asked many questions matilda invited him to perform national airs on all occasions and both admired him as openly as if he had been a pretty child lavinia always cherished a dark suspicion that she narrowly escaped destruction on that eventful night for judging from the frequent melody and the speed of the horses she was sure that either amanda tooted and matilda drove or that both so bewildered the brigand that he lost his head however it was all so delightful that even granny felt the charm and was sure that if they did upset in some romantic spot a dr antonio would spring up as quickly as a mushroom and mend their bones marry one of her giddy charges and end the affair in the most appropriate manner nothing happened fortunately and by nine o'clock they were safely at lugano and tearing themselves from the dear brigand were taken possession of by a shadowy being who fed them in a marble hall with statues ten feet high glaring at them as they ate then led them to a bower which had pale green doors a red carpet blue walls and yellow bed covers all so gay it was like sleeping in a rainbow as if another lovely lake under the windows and moonlight ad libitum was not enough they had music also lavinia scorned the idea of sleep and went prowling about the rooms hanging over the balconies and doing the romantic in a style that was a disgrace to her years she it was who made the superb discovery that the music they heard came from across the way and that by opening a closet window they could look into a theatre and see the stage all rushed at once and beheld an opera in full blast heartily enjoying the unusual advantages of their position for not only could they hear the warblers but see them when the curtain was down what a thing it was to see donna anna do up her black hair don giovanni dance a jig and stately ottavio imbibe refreshment out of a black bottle and the ghostly commander prance like a punchinello as they got him into position the others soon succumbed to sleep but till long after midnight old livy wandered like a ghost from the front balcony with the lovely lake to the closet window and its dramatic joys feeling that no moment of that memorable night should be lost for what other traveller could boast that she ever went to the opera wrapped in a yellow bed quilt on the morrow a few pictures of luini before breakfast and then more sailing over lakes and more driving in festive diligences to menaggio where a boat like a market wagon without wheels bore them genteelly to cadenabia and a week of repose on the banks of lago como their palace did not lift its marble walls to eternal summer by any means for it rained much and was so cold that some took to their beds for warmth stone floors looking like castile soap not being just the thing for rheumatism hand organs dancing bears two hotels one villa no road but the lake and an insinuating boatman with one eye who lay in wait among the willows and popped out to grab a passenger when any one ventured forth are all that remains in the memory regarding Catanabia. A few extracts from Lavinia's notebook may be found useful at this point, both as a speedy way of getting our travellers to Rome and for the bold criticisms on famous places and pictures which they contain. Milan, cathedral like a big wedding cake, last supper in the barracks, did not thrill tried to but couldn't as the picture is so dim it can hardly be seen ambrosian library lock of l borgia's hair tea colored and coarse don't believe in it a bit jolly old books but couldn't touch em 
fine window to dante saw cathedral illuminated very theatrical and much howling of people over the deputies from rome don't know why they illuminated or why they howled didn't ask men here handsome but rude women wear veils and no bonnets fat and ugly gloves very good arch of peace more peace and less arch would be better for italy raphael's marriage of the virgin stiff and stupid can't like raphael dear pious simple old fra angelico suits me better to the public garden with a saw a black ostrich with long pink legs who pranced and looked so like an opera dancer that we sat on the fence and shrieked with laughter pavia to the certosa to see the old carthusian convent founded in thirteen hundred ninety six cloisters gardens and twenty-four little dwellings with chapel bedroom parlor and yard for each monk who is never to speak and comes out but once a week a nice way for lazy men to spend their lives when there is so much work to be done for the lord and his poor wanted to shake them all round though they did look well in their gowns and cowls gliding about the dim cloisters and church perhaps they are kept for that purpose parma dome of church frescoed by correggio all heaven upside down fat angels turning somersaults saints like butchers and martyrs simpering feebly like sees babies much better heaven can't be painted and they'd better not try madonna by girolamo was lovely room of the abbess with rosy children peeping through the lattice very charming madonna della scodella the boy christ very charming the old farnese theatre most interesting got a scrap of canvas from a mouldy scene dead old place is parma bologna drove in a pelting rain to the academy and saw many pictures a pieta by guido was very striking the desolate mother with her dead son on her knees haunted me long afterwards st jerome and the infant christ by elizabeth serrani i liked raphael won't suit yet sad for me but i cannot admire madonnas with faces like fashion plates or dropsical babies with no baby sweetness about them florence bought furs nice climate to bring invalids into always did think italy a humbug and i begin to see i was right acres of pictures like about six out of the lot can't bear the venus or titian's famous hussy hanging over it like his portraits much busts of roman emperors great fun such bad heads the julias faustinas and agrippinas with hair dressed like a big sponge on the brow were so comical i was never tired of looking at them i see now where the present bedlamite style of coiffure comes from the philosophers etc were very interesting cicero so like wendell phillips that i could hardly help clapping my hands and saying hear hear gave a a sad blow by saying the company lay looked like an inlaid workbox did not admire it half so much as i did a magnificent stone pine best of all saw in the old monastery of st marco many works of fra angelico i love his pictures for he put his pious heart into them and one sees and feels it and i don't care if his saints do have six joints to their fingers and impossible noses a very dear picture of providenza poor monks at an empty table and angels bringing bread angelico's picture of heaven was more to my mind than any i have seen no stern avenging god no silly madonna but happy souls playing like children or singing and piping with devout energy relics of savonarola his cell bust beads haircloth shirt and a bit of wood from the pile on which they burnt him i like relics of one man who really lived worked and suffered better than armies of angels or acres of gods and goddesses 
pleasant drives saw artists casa guidi windows and a model baby house with dolly's name on the door and steps modeled by hands that have made famous statues papa's baby house was best of all his works to me a nice little earthquake and a trifle of snow to enhance the charms of this sweet spot visited parker's grave and was afflicted to find it in such an unlovely crowded cemetery it does not matter after all his best monument is in the hearts that love him and the souls he fed as i stood there a little brown bird hopped among the vines that covered the grave pecked its breakfast from a dry seed pod perched on the headstone with a grateful twitter as grace after meat and flew away leaving me comforted by the little sermon it had preached i don't wish to hurt your feelings dear but if this is rome i must say it is a very nasty place began lavinia as they went stumbling through the mud and confusion of a big unfinished station on their arrival at the eternal city people of sense don't judge a place at ten o'clock of a pitch-dark rainy night especially if they are hungry tired and excuse me love rather cross returned amanda severely as they piled into a carriage and drove to piazza di spagna i see a divine fountain a splendid palace now it's a statue of some sort i do believe that dark figure was a monk i know i shall like it in spite of everything cried matilda excitedly flattening her nose against the window she had been much disappointed at not being able to enter rome by daylight so that she might clasp her hands and cry aloud half stifled with the overpowering emotions of the moment roma roma the eternal city bursts upon my view that was the proper thing to do and it was a blow to make so commonplace and ignoble an entry into the city of her dreams early next morning livy was roused from slumber by cries of delight and starting up beheld her artist sister wrapped in a dressing-gown with dishevelled hair staring out of the window and murmuring incoherently spanish steps that's where the models sit propaganda famous jesuit school hope i shall see the little students in their funny hats and gowns that's the great monument thing put up to settle the immaculate conception fuss very fine but the apostles look desperately tired of holding it up dear old houses heavens there's a trattoria man with somebody's breakfast on his head don't see any costumes where are the sheepskin suits the red skirts and white headcloths girl with flowers oh how lovely mercy on us there's an officer staring up here and i never saw him in came the blond head and the blue dressing-gown vanished from the eyes of the handsome soldier who had been attitudinizing with his high boots gray and scarlet cloak jingling sword and becoming barrette cap for the especial benefit of the enraptured stranger livy it is just superb get up and come out at once it is clouding up and i must have one look or lose my mind said matilda flying about with unusual energy you will have to get used to rain if you stay here long my child returned the raven and she was right it poured steadily for two months with occasional flurries of snow also thunder likewise hurricanes the tramontana the sirocco and all the other charming features of an italian winter that nothing might be wanting a nice little inundation was got up for their benefit december twenty eighth sitting peacefully at breakfast on the morning of that day in their cosy apartment with the fire of cones and olive wood cheerily burning on the hearth jocarella the big cat purring on the rug the little coffee-pot proudly perched among bread and butter eggs and fruit while the ladies in dressing-gowns and slippers lounged luxuriously in armchairs one red one blue one yellow they the ladies not the chairs were started by agrippina the maid 
who burst into the room like a bombshell announcing all in one breath that the tiber had risen inundated the whole city and instant death was to be the doom of all rushing to the window to see if the flood had quite covered the steps and cut off all retreat the friends were comforted to observe no signs of water except that half frozen in the basin of the fountain above which leaned their favorite old triton with an icicle on the end of his nose i must go and attend to this the poor will suffer we may be able to help said livy forgetting her bones and beginning to scramble on her fur boots as if the safety of the city depended on her the others followed suit and leaving jokerella to ravage the table they hurried forth to see what father tiber was up to a most reprehensible prank apparently for the lower parts of the city were under water and many of the great streets already as full of boats as venice the corso was a deep and rapid stream and the shopkeepers were disconsolately paddling about trying to rescue their property our dresses are beautiful new dresses where are they now wailed the girls surveying mazzoni's grand store with water up to the balcony where many milliners wrung their hands lamenting the piazza del popolo was a lake with the four stone lions just visible and still spouting water though it was a drug in the market in at the open gate rolled a muddy stream bearing haystacks brushwood and drowned animals along the corso people stood on their balconies wondering what they should do many breakfastless for how could the trattoria boys safely waft their coffee-pots across such canals of water carriages splashed about in shallower parts with agitated loads hurrying to drier quarters many were coming down ladders into boats and crowds stood waiting their turn with bundles of valuables in their hands the soldiers were out in full force working gallantly to save life and property making rafts carrying people on their backs and going through the inundated streets with boatloads of food for the hungry shut up in their ill-provided houses usually at such times the priests did this work but now they stood idly looking on and saying it was a judgment on the people for their treatment of the pope the people were troubled because the priests refused to pray for them but otherwise they snapped their fingers at the sullen old gentleman in the vatican and the brisk brave troops worked for the city quite as well the heretics thought better than the snuffy priests in the ghetto the disaster was truly terrible for the flood came so suddenly that the whole quarter was under water in an hour the scene was pitiful for here the jews lived packed like sardines in a box and being washed out with no warning were utterly destitute in one street a man and woman were seen wading up to their waists in water pushing an old mattress before them on which were three little children all they had saved later in the day as boats of provisions came along women and children swarmed at the windows crying bread bread and their wants could not be supplied in spite of the care of the city authorities one old woman who had lost everything besought the rescuers to bring her a little snuff for the love of heaven which was very characteristic of the race one poor man in trying to save a sick wife and his little ones in a cart upset them and the babies were drowned at their own door comedy and tragedy side by side outside the city houses were carried off people lost and bridges swept away so sudden and violent was the flood the heavy rains and warm winds melted the snow on the mountains and swelled the river till it rose higher than at any time since eighteen hundred five many strangers who came to rome for the christmas holidays sat in their fine apartments without food fire light or company till taken off in boats or supplied by hoisting stores in at the windows we can hold out some time as we live on a hill 
and pina has laid in provisions for several days but if the flood lasts we shall come to want for the wood yards are under water the railroads down and the peasants can't get into the city to bring supplies unless the donkeys swim said amanda reviewing the situation never mind it's so exciting only we must not forget that we engaged to go and see the roast pig aurora to-day answered matilda who insisted on pronouncing roast pigliosi in that improper manner i like this infinitely better than any of your picturesque refrigerators and it thrills me more to watch one of those dear dirty soldiers save women and babies than to see a dozen dying gladiators gasping for centuries in immortal marble added lavinia who had shocked her artistic friends by sniffing at the famous statue and wishing the man would die and done with it and not lie squirming there come away matt she has no soul for art and it is all in vain to try and breathe one into her said amanda with the calm pity of one who had read up every great picture studied up every famous statue and knew what to admire when to thrill and just where the various emotions should come in so they left the outcast perched on a wall waving her muff at them and calling out matter for ever to the great horror of an english lady who would have seen all rome upset without any unseemly excitement that night the gas gave out and mysterious orders were left at houses for lamps to be kept burning till morning thieves abounded and the ladies prepared their arms one pistol one dagger and a large umbrella then slept peacefully undisturbed by the commotion in the kitchen where cats live chickens and pina's five grandmothers all lived together rent free amanda's last prediction was that they would find themselves gently floating out at the porta pia about midnight matt wailed for a submerged gallery in which she had hoped to ice herself on the morrow and livy indulged the sinful hope that the pope would get his pontifical petticoats very wet be a little drowned and terribly scared by the flood because he spoilt the christmas festivities and shut up all the cardinal's red coaches next day the water began to abate and people made up their minds that the end of the world was not yet gentlemen paid visits on the backs of stout soldiers ladies went shopping in boats and family dinners were handed in at two-story windows without causing any remark so quickly do people adapt themselves to the inevitable hardly had the watery excitement subsided when a new event set the city in an uproar the king was not expected till the tenth of january but the kind soul could not wait and as soon as the road was passable he came with three hundred thousand francs in his hands to see what he could do for his poor romans he arrived at four a m and though unexpected the news flew through the city and a crowd turned out with torches to escort him to the quirinal again did the explosive pina burst in upon her mistresses with the news this time in tears of joy for the people began to think the king would never come and therefore were especially touched by this prompt visit in the midst of their trouble the handsome damsel was a spectacle herself so dramatic was she as she shook her fist at the pope and cheered for the king with a ladle in one hand an artichoke in the other her fine eyes flashing and her mellow voice trembling while she talked regardless of the polenta going to destruction in the frying pan on went the bonnets out flew the ladies and rushed up to the quirinal where stood a great crowd waiting eagerly for a sight of the king there was a great bustle among the officials and splendid creatures in new uniforms ran about in all directions grand carriages arrived bringing the high and mighty gaping but loyal to greet their lord general marmora a thin shabby energetic man was everywhere for the new order of things seemed a little hitchy dorius and colonus 
gladden plebeian eyes and the people cheered everything from the commander-in-chief to somebody's breakfast borne through the crowd by a stately james in livery who graciously acknowledged the homage for one mortal hour our lady stood in a pelting raid and then retired feeling that the sacrifice of their best hats was all that could reasonably be expected of free-born americans they consoled themselves by putting out pina's fine italian banner made in secret and kept ready for her king for the padrona was papalino and supporting it by two little american flags the stars and stripes of which much perplexed the boys and donkeys disporting themselves in the piazza barberini but the excitement was so infectious that the girls could not resist another run after royalty so while livy consoled herself with the fire and the cat they took a carriage and chased the king till they caught him at the capitol they had a fine view of him as he came down the long steps almost alone and at the peril of his life through a mass of people cheering frantically and whitening the streets with waving handkerchiefs the enthusiastic damsels mounted up beside the driver and hurrahed with all their hearts and voices as well they might for it certainly was a sight to see the courage of the king entrusting himself in a city full of enemies touched the people quite as much as the kindly motive that brought him there and kept him sacred in their eyes the girls had a second view of him on the balcony of the quirinal for the populace clamoured so for another sight of il rey that the pope's best velvet hangings were hastily spread and victor emmanuel came out and bowed to his people who stood on their heads with joy as amanda expressed it he was in citizen's dress and looked like a stout brown soldierly man not so ugly as the pictures of him but not an apollo by any means hating ceremony and splendor he would not have the fine apartments prepared for him but chose a plain room saying keep the finery for my son if you like i prefer this he drove through the ghetto and all the desolated parts of the city to see with his own eyes the ruin made and then desired the city fathers to give to the poor the money they had set apart to make a splendid welcome for him he only spent one day and returned to florence at night all rome was at the station to see him off ladies with carriages full of flowers troops of soldiers and throngs of poor people blessing him like a saint for this kingly sympathy of his had won all hearts when he does make his grand entry we will decorate our balcony and have our six windows packed with loyal yankees who will hurrah their best for the honest man as they call victor emmanuel and that is high praise for a king so said the three and while waiting for the event which did not occur in their day however they indulged in all the pastimes modern rome afforded they shivered through endless galleries getting cricks in their necks staring at frescoes and injuring their optic nerves poring over pictures so old that often nothing was visible but a mahogany coloured leg an oily face or the dim outline of a green saint in a whirlwind of pink angels they grubbed in catacombs and came up mouldy they picnicked in the tomb of cecilia metella flirted in the palace of the caesars not in the classical manner however got cold by moonlight in the Colosseum, and went sketching in the baths of caracalla which last amusement generally ended in the gentlemen and ladies drawing each other and returning delighted with the study of art in dear rome they went to fancy parties where artists got themselves up like their own statues and pictures and set medieval fashions which it was a pity the rest of the world did not follow they drank much social tea with titled beings as thick as blackberries and better still men and women who had earned noble names for themselves with pencil pen or chisel 
they paid visits in palaces where the horses lived in the basement rich foreigners on the first floor artists next and princes in the attic they went to the hunt and saw scarlet coats fine horses bad riding many hounds and no foxes as a change they got up game parties a la little athens in their own small salon introduced the potato pantomime had charades and enacted the immortal jarley's waxworks on one of the seven hills a true yankee breakfast of fish balls johnny cake and dip toast was given in their honor and its delights much enhanced by its being eaten in a lovely room with reeds and rushes on the pale green walls shell-shaped chairs and coral mirror frames what a thing it was to consume those familiar viands in a famous palace with guido's chintzy downstairs a great sculptor next door three lovely boys as waiters and titian tea to head the feast and followed up with dates from the nile and egyptian sketches that caused the company to vote a speedy adjournment to the land of corkindills and pyramids these and many other joys they tasted and when all else palled upon them they drove on the compagna and were happy chapter five continued of shawl straps a second series of aunt joe's scrap bag this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org shawl straps a second series of aunt joe's scrap bag by louisa may alcott chapter five it is sad to be obliged to record that these quiet drives were the especial delight of the unsocial lavinia whose ill-regulated mind soon wearied of swell society classical remains and artistic revelry ancient rome would have suited her excellently she thought but modern rome was such a chaos of frivolity and fanaticism poverty and splendor dirt and devilry dead grandeur and living ignorance that she felt as if shut up in a magnificent tomb the bad air of which was poisoning both body and soul her only consolation was the new freedom that seemed to blow over rome like a wholesome wind old residents lamented the loss of the priestly pageants fetes and ceremonies but this republican spinster preferred to see rome guarded by her own troops and governed by her own king who ordered streets to be cleaned fountains filled schools opened and all good institutions made possible rather than any amount of papal purple covering poverty ignorance and superstition better than the sight of all the red coaches that ever rumbled was the spectacle of many boys quitting the jesuit college and demanding admittance into the free schools and sweeter than the music of all the silver trumpets that ever blew were the voices of happy men and women singing once forbidden songs of liberty in the streets of rome these sentiments and others equally unfashionable were only breathed into the ear of sister matilda when the two retired to the compagna to confide to one another the secrets of their souls a process necessary about once a week for after visiting studios going to parties and telling polite fibs about everything they saw it was impossible to exist without finding a vent of some sort once out among the aqueducts matilda could freely own that she thought genius a rare article in the studios where she expected to learn so much and lavinia could make the awful avowal that parties at which the order of performance was gossip tea music then music tea and gossip all together were not her idea of intellectual society their criticisms on pictures and statues 
cannot be recorded without covering their humble names with infamy and why the sky did not fall upon or the stones rise up and smite these vandals is a mystery to this day they did enjoy much in their own improper manner but poor amanda's sufferings can better be imagined than described so when lavinia early in march proposed to flee to the mountains before they became quite demoralized and learned to steal and stab as well as lie and lounge she readily assented and they retired to albano the decline and fall of the roman empire was nothing to this and never have i seen such unappreciative women as you two sighed amanda as they rolled away from numero due piazza barberini leaving agrippina sobbing at the top of the stairs and the padrona bobbing little curtsies at the bottom i am sure the sensi will haunt me all my days and so will many other famous things said matilda while her eyes roved fondly from a very brown capuchin monk to a squad of bersaglieri trotting by with jaunty cock's feathers dancing in the wind muskets gleaming and trim boots skipping through the mud with martial regularity when i get the contents of my head sorted out i shall doubtless rejoice that i have seen rome but just now all that i can clearly recall are the three facts that the pope had a fit our dear man romeo got very tipsy one night and that we went to see the sistine chapel the day the eclipse made it as dark as a pocket yes continued lavinia with an air of decision i am glad to have seen this classical cesspool and still more glad to have got out of it alive she added sniffing the air from the mountains as if the odor of sanctity which pervaded the holy city did not suit her it blew great guns up at albano and the society consisted chiefly of donkeys but the ladies enjoyed themselves nevertheless and felt better and better every day for early hours much exercise and no aesthetic tea soon set them up after the dissipation of the winter three pleasing events diversified their stay the first happened the day after they arrived the girls went forth early to look about them and to see if they could find a little apartment where all could be more comfortable than in the breezy rooms at the hotel following the grassy road that winds down the valley below the viaduct they came to a lovely garden and finding the gate open went in a queer old villa was perched on the hill above and a manly form was observed to be leaning from a balcony as if enjoying the fine view from the height i fancy that house was empty or we wouldn't have come in never mind we won't go back now and if any one comes after us we will apologize and say we lost our way going to ajaccio said amanda as they went calmly forward among the posy beds that lay blooming on the hillside it was well they prepared themselves for the manly form suddenly disappeared from the balcony and a moment afterwards came swiftly towards them through the shrubs a comely young gentleman who greeted them with italian grace accepted their apology smiling and begged them to walk in his garden whenever they liked it was always open he said and the peasants often used that path admiring but never hurting a leaf hearing that they were in search of an apartment he instantly begged them to come up and look at some rooms in the villa his father was a refugee from france and desired to let a part of his house come and behold these delightful rooms so charming was the interest he took in the errant damsels that they could not resist and after rolling up their eyes at one another to express their enjoyment of the adventure they graciously followed the handsome youth into the villa with confiding hospitality he took them everywhere into his mother's room the kitchen and nursery in the latter place they found two small boys who bore such a striking resemblance to napoleon the first that the girls spoke of it and were enraptured at the reply they received truly yes we belong to the family 
my mother is a bonaparte my father count here's richness and romance what will livy say whispered the girls to one another as their guide left them in the salon and went to find his father she will scold us for coming here said amanda remembering her own lectures on the proprieties yes but she will forgive us the minute we say napoleon for that bad little man is one of her heroes added matt pretending to be admiring the view while she privately examined a lady in a bower below a stout dark lady with all the family traits so strongly marked that there could be no doubt of the young man's assertion presently he came back with an affable old gentleman who evidently had an eye to the main chance for in spite of his elegance and affability he asked a great price for his rooms and felt that any untitled stranger should be glad to pay well for the honor of living under the roof of a bonaparte amanda left the decision to her invisible duenna and with a profusion of compliments and thanks they got away being gallantly escorted to the gate by the young count who filled their hands with flowers and gazed pensively after them as if he found the society of two bright american girls very agreeable after that of his lofty parents or the peasantry of the town home they ran and bounced in upon livy blooming and breathless to pour out their tale and suggest an immediate departure to the blissful spot where counts and crocuses flourished with italian luxuriance but after the first excitement had subsided lavinia put a wet blanket on the entire plan by declaring that she would never board with any grasping old patrician who would charge for every bow and fall back on his ancestors if he was found cheating she would go and look at the place but not enter it nor be beholden to the resident apollo for so much as a dandelion so the morning damsels led the griffin over the viaduct through the dirty little town by the villa on its least attractive side up at the window were the two little napoleonic heads with big black eyes strong chins and dark hair streaked across wide olive-coloured foreheads a vision of papa was visible in the garden pruning a vine with gloves on his aristocratic hands and a shabby velvet coat on his highly connected back also afar off on the balcony oh sight to touch a maiden's heart was the young count gazing wistfully towards albano he did not see the charmers as they crept down the rough road close to the garden wall and went sadly home along the blooming path to the tomb of the four thimbles as livy irreverently called the ruin which has an ornament at each of its corners like a gigantic thimble of stone a note in amanda's most elegant french declining the apartments in the name of madame duenna closed the door of this eden upon the wandering paris who entered never more now and then as they went clattering by on their donkeys to lake nemi or some other picturesque spot they saw again the crocus bloom and leaning from that lofty room sir lancelot with face of gloom looked down to camelot up flew their veils and floated wide but livy pinned them to her side the curse has come upon us cried the ladies of shalott the second adventure befell amanda alone and in this wise going one day to rome on business she found herself shut up in a car with a gorgeous officer and a meek young man who read papers all the way the tall soldier in his grey and silver uniform with a furred frogged and braided jacket not to mention the high boots or the becoming cap was so very polite to the lone lady that she could not remain dumb without positive rudeness so amanda conversed in her most charming manner finding inspiration doubtless in the dark eyes and musical voice of her handsome vis-a-vis -vis, for the officers from turin are things of beauty and joys for ever to those who love to look on manly men among other things the two had a little joke about the baron rothschild 
who rode about albano on a tiny donkey with two servants behind him also the baroness a painfully plain woman with an ugly dog the image of herself when they arrived at rome however their joke was turned against them by the discovery that the meek man was the baron's secretary who would doubtless repeat their chat at headquarters to see the handsome man slap his brow and then laugh like a boy at the fun was worth a longer journey amanda thought as he put her into a carriage gave her his best martial salute and went clanking away about his own affairs amanda returned at four p m and her emotions may be imagined when the dark face of her officer peered in at the car window and the melodious voice asked if he might be permitted to enter of course he might and as no secretary now spoilt the tete-a-tete mars became delightfully confidential and poured his woes into the sympathizing bosom of amanda it had been a great affliction to him that his regiment was quartered at albano for some months mio dio so dull was it life had already become a burden but now if the signorina was to be there if she permitted him to make himself known to her party what joys were in store for him the signorina loved to ride behold he had superb horses languishing in the stables that henceforth were dedicated to her use his fellow officers were gentlemen of good family brave as lions and dying of ennui if they might be presented to the ladies life would be worth having and albano a paradise etc to all this devotion the prudent amanda listened with pleasure but promised nothing till signore mars had made the acquaintance of certain american gentlemen and married ladies then it would be possible to enjoy the delights of which he spoke the colonel vowed he would instantly devote himself to this task and thus they came to the lonely little station at albano amanda had ordered the carriage to meet her but it was not there and she was forced to wait till all her fellow passengers were gone all but the gallant officer who decorously remained outside marching to and fro as if on guard till his servant came with his horse then he begged to be allowed to see why the carriage did not come and amanda consented for night was falling and two miles of mud lay between her and home away dashed the servant but his master did not follow standing in the doorway he declared that he must remain as the signorina's protector for no trains were due for hours the depot man was gone and it was too late for any lady to stay there alone again amanda gratefully consented wondering what would be the end of her adventure and again the stately colonel resumed his march outside singing as he tramped and evidently enjoying the escort duty that gave him so good an opportunity of displaying not only his gallantry but his fine voice and handsome figure down rattled the carriage at last accompanied to amanda's dismay by three of the colonel's friends who had evidently received a hint of the affair and had come to have a hand in it with much bowing of the gentlemen and much prancing of their fine horses amanda was handed to her seat and went lumbering back to the hotel with her splendid escort careering about her to the great edification of the town when the rescued damsel told the tale to her mates matilda tore her hair and lamented that she had not been there even the stern livy had no lecture for the erring lamb but was as full of interest as either of the girls for anything in the shape of a soldier was dear to her heart when the ladies rode forth next day three elegant st george's in full rig saluted as these modern unas ambled by on their meek donkeys a performance punctually executed ever afterward whenever the three blue veils appeared much curvetting went on before the hotel door much clanking of spurs and sabres was heard in the little lane on to which the apartment of the ladies looked and splendid officers seemed to spring up like violets 
in secluded spots where maidens loved to stroll it was all very nice and the girls were beginning to feel that the charms of albano rivaled those of rome when a sad blow upset their castles in the air and desolated the knights over the way the highly respectable americans who were to serve as the link between the soldiers and the ladies decidedly declined the office objecting to the martial gentleman as being altogether too dangerous to bring into the dovecote so the poor dears sighed in vain and the longing damsels never rode the fine horses that were temptingly paraded before them on all occasions they did their best but it was soon evident to lavinia that in some unguarded moment the impetuous mat would yield to the spell and go gambading away for a ride sans duenna sans habit sans propriety sans everything amanda likewise seemed losing her head and permitted the dark-eyed colonel to talk to her when they met only a moment but what a perilous moment it was when the six-foot mars leaned over a green hedge and talked about the weather in the softest italian that ever melted a woman's heart i'm going to venice next week so you may as well make up your minds to it girls i cannot bear this awful responsibility any longer for i am very sure you will both be off to turin with those handsome rascals if we stay much longer my mind is made up and i won't hear a word thus lavinia with a stern countenance for the romantic old lady felt the charm as much as the girls did and decided that discretion was the better part of valor for the whole party i should never dare to go home and tell my honored parents that matt had run away with a man as handsome as jove and as poor as job amanda's indignant relatives would rise up and stone me if i let her canter into matrimony with the fascinating colonel who may have a wife and ten children in turin for all we know they must be torn away at once or my character as duenna is lost forever having made up her mind livy steeled her heart to all appeals and wrote letters packed trunks and watched her little flock like a vigilant sheep-dog how she would ever have got them through that last week is very uncertain if a providential picnic had not helped her a fair was held in the town and a delightful surprise party was got up among the artists of rome twenty-five came driving over in a big carriage with four gaily decorated horses postilions hampers of lunch flutes and horns and much jollity bottled up for the occasion a very festive spectacle they made as they drove through the narrow streets with flowers and streamers in their hats singing and joking in true artistic style they meant to have lunched in the open air but as it was cloudy decided to spread the feast at the hotel such a delightful revel as followed a scene from the decameron modernized would give some idea of it for after the banquet all adjourned to the gardens of the doria villa and there disported themselves as merrily as if all the plagues of life were quite forgotten and death itself among the lost arts flirting and dancing charades and singing stories and statues poems and pictures gossip and gambols absorb the hours as pleasantly as in the olden time and if the costumes were not as picturesque as those in vetter's fine picture the ladies were as lovely the gentlemen as gallant and all much better behaved than those of boccaccio's party a few drops of rain quenched the fun at its height and sent the revellers home as fast as four horses could take them leaving the town gaping after them and our ladies much enlivened by the delights of the day this third and last event pleasantly ended their sojourn at albano for a day or two later they vanished leaving the dear officers disconsolate till the next batch of travelling ladies came to comfort their despair a week was spent in venice floating about all day from one delightful old church to another 
or paying visits to titians and tintorettos buying little turtles photographs or venetian glass eating candied fruit and seeing the doves fed in the square of san marco visiting shops full of dusty antiquities or searching the stalls on the rialto for moore's head rings being rowed to the lido by giacomo in a red sash and lulled to sleep at night by the songs of a chorus that floated under the windows in the moonlight lavinia never could get used to seeing the butcher the baker and the postman go their rounds in boats matilda was in bliss with a gondola all to herself where she sat surrounded with water-colors trying to paint everything she saw for here the energy she had lost at rome seemed to return to her amanda haunted a certain shop trying to make the man take a reasonable sum for a very ancient and ugly bit of jewelry which she called a sprugalerio for want of a better name and after each failure she went off to compose herself with a visit to the doges of course they all saw the bridge of sighs and the dungeons below with their many horrors likewise a mass at st mark's where the patriarch was a fat old soul in red silk even to his shoes and holy pocket handkerchief and the service appeared to consist in six purple priests dressing and undressing him like an old doll while a dozen white-gowned boys droned up in a gold cockloft and many beggars whined on the dirty floor below do other travellers eat locusts i wonder as ours did one sunny day sitting on church steps and discover that the food of the apostle was not the insect whose zing foretells hot weather but the long dry pods of the locust tree sweet to the taste but rather dry fodder as the impious livy remarked after choking herself with a quarter of a yard of it when the week was up matt implored to be left behind with angela the maid and brio a big poodle possessed of the devil but she was torn away and only consoled by the promise of many new gloves with as many buttons as she pleased when they got to munich the lakes are the proper entrance into italy and venice a lovely exit one soon tires of it and is ready to leave which is an excellent arrangement though i should prefer to depart in some more cheerful vehicle than a hearse observed lavinia as they left the long black gondola at the steps of the station haven't you a sigh for those lovely lakes a tear for albano a pang of regret for rome asked amanda hoping to wring one moan for italy from the old lady not a sigh not a tear not a regret i find i like them all better the farther i get from them and by the time i am at home i may be able to say i adore them but i doubt it returned the incorrigible livy and from that moment a Chapter 6 of Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.D. Gavin. Shawl Straps, a second series of Aunt Jo's Scrap Bag by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 6 London. From this moment I cease to be the commander-in-chief. Livy adores England, can speak the language, understands the money, and knows all about London. So she shall be the leader, and I will repose after my long labor. With this remark, Amanda retired from the office, covered with glory, and her mates vowed to erect a statue in her honor as a token of their undying gratitude. Lavinia took the lead from the moment they landed at St. Catherine's Wharf, and though somewhat demoralized by a rough passage of eighteen hours from Antwerp, was equal to the occasion. She did love England, and thought London the most delightful city in the world, next to Boston. Its mud and fog were dear to her, its beef and beer were nectar and ambrosia. After the continental slops and messes, its steady-going, respectable citizens— 
beautiful in her eyes, and the words home and comfort were not an idle mockery here. Therefore the old lady joyfully sniffed the smoky air, gazed with tenderness on the grimy houses, and cast herself, metaphorically speaking, into the arms of a stout, ruddy-faced porter, as if at last she had found a man and a brother. Nobly did the burly Briton repay her confidence and earn the shilling which in England makes all things possible. He bore them to the station, got tickets, checked luggage, put the ladies in a first-class compartment, gave them all necessary directions about the hotel they were after, and when the bell rang, touched his cap with a smile upon his dear red face, which caused Lavinia to add a sixpence to the shilling she gave him with a mental blessing. This is truly a decent country. See how well one is cared for, how civil everybody is, how honest, how manly, began Livy, as she mounted her hobby and prepared for a canter over the prejudices of her friend, for Amanda detested England because she knew nothing of it. The cabman cheated us, asked double fares, replied the dear girl, wrapping herself in many cloaks and refusing to admire the fog. Not at all, cried Livy. The trunks were immense, and you'll find we shall have to pay extra for them everywhere. It is the same as having them weighed and paying for the pounds, only this saves much time and trouble. Look at the handsome guard in his silver-plated harness. How much nicer he is than a gabbling Italian or a Frenchman who compliments you one minute and behaves like a brute the next. It does my soul good to see the clean, rosy faces and hear good English instead of gibberish. Never in my life have I seen such tall, fine-looking men. Only they are all fair, which isn't my style, observed Matilda, with a secret sigh for the dark-eyed heroes from Turin. Thus conversing, they soon came to the G Hotel, just at the end of the railway, and without going out of the station, found themselves settled in comfortable rooms. Regard, if you please, these toilet arrangements. Two sorts of bath pan, two cans of cold water, one of hot, two big pitchers, much soap, and six towels about the size of tablecloths. I call that an improvement on the continental cup, saucer, and napkin accommodation said Lavinia, proudly displaying a washstand that looked like a dinner table laid for a dozen. Such was the display of glass, china, and napery. The English certainly are a clean people, replied Amanda, softening a little as she remembered her fruitless efforts to find a bath pan in Brittany, where the people said the drought was caused by the English using so much water. They'd need more appliances for cleanliness than any other race, because they live in such a dirty country began Matilda, removing the soot from her face in flakes. What more she might have said is unknown, for Livy closed her mouth with a big sponge and all retired to repose after the trials of the past night. Now, my dears, you shall have food fit for Christian women to eat. No weak soup, no sour wine, no veal stewed with raisins, nor greasy salad made of all the weeds that grow beef that will make you feel like giants, and beer that will cheer the cockles of your hearts, not to mention cheese which will make you wink, and bread with a little round button atop the loaf, like the grand panjandrum in the old story. Thus Lavinia enthusiastically, as she led her flock of two into the eating room at luncheon time, being seated at a little table by one of the great windows, the old lady continued to sing the praises of Britannia while wafting for the repast. "'Isn't this better than a stone-floored café with nine clocks all wrong, seven mirrors all cracked, much drapery all dirty, a flock of garçons who fly about like lunatics, and food which I shudder to think of? Look at this lofty room, this grave, thick carpet, that cheerful coal fire, these neat little tables, these large, clean windows.' these quiet, ministerial waiters who seem to take a paternal interest in your wants, and best of all, this simple, wholesome, well-cooked food. Here the arrival of a glorified beefsteak in a shining pint pot of foaming ale give an appropriate finish to Livy's lecture. She fell upon her lunch like a famished woman and was speechless till much meat had vanished and the ale was low in the pot. It is good, admitted Amanda, who took to her beer like a born Englishwoman and swallowed some of her prejudices with her delicious beef. 
It's such a comfort to know that I am not eating a calf's brains or pig's feet, that I can enjoy it with a free mind, and the sight of those two beautiful old gentlemen gives it an added relish, said Matilda, who had been watching a pair of hale old fellows eat their lunch in a solid, leisurely way that would have been impossible to an American. It is so restful to see people take things calmly and not bolt their meals or rush about like runaway steam engines. It is this moderation that keeps Englishmen so hearty, jolly, and long-lived. They don't tear themselves to pieces as we do, but take time for rest, exercise, food, and recreation, like sensible people as they are. It is like reposing on a feather bed to live here, and my tired nerves rejoice in it, said Lavinia, eating bread and cheese as if that was her mission in life. A slight amount of haste will be advisable, my granny, unless we intend to spend all our substance on these restful comforts of yours. This hotel is delightfully cozy, but expensive, so the quicker we go into lodgings, the better for us, suggested the thrifty Amanda, seeing that Livy was too infatuated to care for cost. I'll go the first thing tomorrow and look at the rooms Mrs. Blank recommended to us. This afternoon we will rest and write letters, unless someone comes to call, said Livy, leading her girls to the reading room where sleep inviting chairs, tables supplied with writing materials, and groves of newspapers wooed the stranger to repose. Hardly were they seated, however, than Jeeves brought in the card of a friend who had been told when they would arrive and hastened at once to meet them. How pleasant is the first familiar face one sees in a strange land. Doubly pleasant was Mr. C's, because he brought hospitable invitations from other friends, kind welcomes, and tickets to several of the art exhibits then open. Hardly had he gone, after a half-hour's chat, than another card was handed, and the name it bore caused a slight flutter in the dovecot. A friend of Miss Livy's, in Boston, had sent orders to his brother in London to devote himself to the wandering ladies when they came. They had never met, the poor man didn't care to have his quiet invaded by strange women, and to do the honors of London is no small task. Yet this heroic gentleman obeyed orders without a murmur, and leaving his artistic seclusion, shouldered his burden with the silent courage of a Spartan. A grave, dark little man, with fine eyes, quiet manners, and a straightforward way with him that suited Blunt Livy excellently. How he dared to face the three unknown women so calmly, listen to their impossible suggestions so politely, and offer himself as a slave so cheerfully will forever remain a mystery to those grateful souls. His first service was to pack them into a cab and bear them safely to the bankers for letters and money, and this he followed up by several weeks of servitude, which must have been worse than Egyptian bondage. Two more large ladies joined the party after they were settled in lodgings at Kensington. But, undaunted by the fact, this long-suffering man escorted the whole five to galleries and theaters, trips into the city, and picnics in the country, went shopping with them, lugged parcels, ran errands, paid bills, and was in fact the sheet anchor of the whole party. Imagine the emotions of one shy man when called upon to lead a flock of somewhat imposing ladies everywhere and to have two calves full on all occasions, to be obliged to support the invalids, to follow the caprices of the giddy, to gratify the demands of the curious, and to hear the gabble of the whole five, day after day. Berger's brave man was a coward compared to him, for he not only gave his days, but his evenings also, joining in endless games of whist, drinking much weak tea, and listening to any amount of twaddle on all subjects. The society was not such as intelligent men enjoy, being composed of two Egyptian boys and three fussy old ladies. One of them was immensely stout, wore a bright green cap, with half a pint of scarlet cherries bobbing on her brow. She talked on all subjects, and handed round an album full of her own poems on all occasions. The second must have been a sister of Mrs. T.'s aunt, so grim and incoherent was she. Sitting in the corner... She stared at the world around her with an utterly expressionless countenance, and when least expected broke out with some startling remarks, such as, If that fence had been painted green, we should get to heaven sooner. Or, Before I had fits, my memory was as good as anybody's, but my daughter married a clergyman and took it with her. 
The third antiquity was the hostess, a buxom lady, much given to gay attire and reminiscences of past glory. Before me husband went into public life, the strangers innocently supposed the departed Mr. K to have been an M.P. at least, and were rather taken aback on learning that he had been a pawnbroker. The Egyptian youths were handsome, dark lads, with melodious voices, lustrous eyes, and such fiery tempers that one never knew whether they were going to pass the bread or stab one with a carving knife. As a slight mitigation of this slow society, the Russian from Pension Paradis appeared with his broadcloth, more resplendent than ever. The ladies had seen him in Rome, but the fever scared him away, and he was now fleeing from another lodging house, where the hostess evidently intended to marry him to her daughter in the McStinger fashion. In this varied circle did the devoted being aforementioned pass many hours after the day's hard labor was happily over, and when anyone pitied him for leading the life of a galley slave, he hid his anguish and answered with a smile, my brother told me to do it, and I never disobey Tom. In fact, I find I rather like it. That last fib was truly sublime, and the name of Casabianca pales before that of one who obeyed fraternal commands to the letter, and tried to love his duty, heavy as it was. If, as has been sometimes predicted, England had gone under just then, it might truly have been said, though prince and peer and poet rare were sunk among the piles, the noblest man who perished there was faithful W. N. S. The sightseeing fever raged fiercely at first, and the flock of Americans went from Windsor Castle to the Tower of London, from Westminster Abbey to Madame Tussaud's waxwork show, with a vigor that appalled the natives. They would visit two or three galleries in the morning, lunch at Dolly's, the dark little chop house which Johnson, Goldsmith, and the other worthies used to frequent in the good old times, go to Richmond in the afternoon and dine at the Star and Garter, or to Greenwich to eat white baits fish, as the Russian called the celebrated dish, and finish off the evening at some theater, getting home at midnight in a procession of two cabs and a hansom. When the first excitement was over, Lavinia and Matilda took a turn at society, having friends in London. Amanda could not conquer her prejudices sufficiently to accompany them, and falling back on the climate as her excuse, stayed at home and improved her mind. I feel now like girls in novels. You are the Duchess of Devonshire, and I am Lady Maud Plantagenet, going to a ball at Buckingham Palace. I know that I was made to sit in the lap of luxury. It agrees with me so well, said Matilda. As the two rolled away to Aubrey House in a brougham, all lamps, glass, and satin, her long blue train lay piled up before her. The light flashed on her best Roman earrings. Her curls were in their most picturesque array, and, crowning joy of all, cream-colored gloves with six buttons covered her arms and filled her soul with happiness because they were so elegant and cost so little, being bought in Rome just after the flood. Dowager Livy responded gravely from the depths of her silver-gray silk, enlivened with pink azaleas. My child, thank your stars that you are a free-born Yankee and have no great name or state to keep up. Buckingham Palace is all very well, and I shouldn't mind calling on Mrs. Gullop or Saxe Colberg, whichever it is. But I much prefer to be going to the house of a radical M.P., who is lending a hand to all good works. Mrs. T. is a far more interesting woman to me than Victoria, for her life is spent in helping her fellow creatures. I consider her a model Englishwoman, simple, sincere, and accomplished, full of good sense, intelligence, and energy. Her house is open to all, friend and stranger, black and white, rich and poor, great men and earnest women meet there, Mazzini and Francis Power Cobb, John Bright and Jean Inglo, Rossetti the poet, and Elizabeth Garrett, the brave little doctor. Though wealthy and living in a historical mansion, the host is the most unassuming man in it, and the hostess the simplest dressed lady. If they want a drawing teacher, I'll offer myself, for I think that is regularly splendid, said Matilda warmly, as Livy paused for breath after her harangue. With these new ideas in her head, Lady Maud enjoyed her party while the duchess reveled in radicals to her heart's content, for Aubrey House was their headquarters, and all were out in full force. It was cheering to our spinster to find that things had moved a good deal since a former visit. 
five or six years before, when Mill had carried into the House of Commons a woman's rights petition that filled both arms. People laughed then, and the stout-hearted women laughed also, but said, Our next petition shall be so big, it will have to go in a wheelbarrow. Now the same people talked over the question soberly, and began to think something besides fun might come of it. The pioneers rejoiced over several hard-won battles, and the scoffers came to see that the truest glory was won by those who did the hard work, and stood by a good cause when most unpopular, not by those who kept out of the field till the fight was over, and then came in to wave the flags and beat the drums over victories they had not helped to win. It seems to me that these English women make less noise and do more work than we Americans. I shouldn't dare to say so in public, but their quiet, orderly ways suits me better than the more demonstrative performances of my friends at home. Slow coaches, as we call them. I should not be surprised that they got the suffrage before we did, as the tortoise one in the fable was Lavinia's secret thought as they drove away after a very charming evening. Perhaps the fact that reforms of all sorts had been poured into her ears till her head was like a hive of bees may account for this unpatriotic thought, or it may be the pleasant effect of the healthful aspect of these English workers. Old or young, all seemed to have cheerful, well-balanced minds and strong, healthy bodies. No one complained of her nerves, or let them unconsciously put a sharp edge to her tongue, give a blue tinge to her world, or sour the milk of human kindness in her heart less quick and bright, perhaps, than the ladies over the sea, but more womanly and full of quiet tenacity of purpose better than eloquence. Miss Livy's taste being of a peculiar sort, and pictures having palled upon her to such a degree that she couldn't even look at an ornamental signboard without disgust, she often left her more artistic friends and went forth on excursions of her own. As she never used either map or guidebook, it was a wonder how she found her way and the infants were often on the point of sending for the city crier, if there is such a functionary, to find the lost duenna. But old Livy always turned up at last, mud to the eyes, tired out, and more deeply impressed than ever with the charms of London. One day she set forth to hear Spurgeon, being told that Lambeth was a wretched quarter of the city, that the tabernacle was two or three miles away, and very difficult to enter when found, only added zest to the thing, and she departed, sure of finding adventures if not Spurgeon. If an omnibus conductor had not befriended her, she would probably have found herself at Hampstead or Chelsea, for London buses are as bewildering as London streets. Thanks to this amiable man, who evidently felt that the stranger in his gates needed all his care, the old lady safely reached the elephant and castle, and was dismissed with a moss rosebud from the lips of her friend, a reassuring pat on the shoulder, and a paternal, "'Ey, my dear,' which unexpected attentions caused her to depart with speed. There certainly was a need of the tabernacle in the quarter, for the poverty and wickedness were very dreadful. Boys not yet in their teens staggered by, half-tipsy, or lounged at the doors of gin-shops. Bonnetless girls roamed about singing and squabbling, forlorn babies played in the gutter, and men and women in every stage of raggedness and degradation marred the beauty of that fair Sunday morning. Crowds were swarming into the tabernacle, but, thanks to the order a friend had given her, Miss Livy was handed to a comfortable seat, with a haggard Magdalen on one side and a palsy-stricken old man on the other. Staring about her, she saw an immense building with two galleries extending round three sides, and a double sort of platform behind and below the pulpit, which was a little pen lifted high that all might see and hear. Every seat, aisle, window ledge, step, and doorway was packed with a strange congregation, all nations, all colors, all ages, and nearly all bearing the sad marks of poverty or sin. They all sung, cried out if anything affected or pleased them in the sermon, and listened with interest to the plain yet fervent words of a man who has gathered together this flock of black sheep and is so faithful a shepherd to them. Everyone knows how Spurgeon looks in pictures, but in the pulpit he reminded Livy of Martin Luther, a square, florid face, stout figure, a fine, keen eye, and a natural, decided manner, very impressive, a strong, clear voice of much dramatic power, and a way of walking the pulpit like Father Taylor. His sermon was on small temptations, and he illustrated it by facts and examples taken from real life pointing out several of his congregation and calling them by name, which original proceedings seemed to find favor with his people. 
he used no notes but talked rather than preached and leaning over the railing urged argued prayed and sang with a hearty eloquence very effective and decidedly refreshing after high church mummery abroad and drowsy unitarianism at home now and then he stopped to give directions for the comfort of his flock in a free and easy manner which called up irresistible smiles on the faces of strangers mrs flacker you better take that child into the ante-room he's tired come this way friends there's plenty of room open all the windows manning it's very warm and when a sad sort of crying interrupted him he looked down at an old woman shaking with epilepsy and mildly remarked don't be troubled brethren our sister is subject to fits and preached tranquilly on for two hours he held that great gathering in spite of heat discomfort and other afflictions of the flesh and ended by saying in a paternal way now remember what i've said through the week and next sunday show me that i haven't talked in vain he read a list of meetings for every night in the week one especially struck livy as it was for mothers to meet and talk over with him the best ways of teaching and training their children spurgeon evidently did not spare his own time and strength and whatever his creed may be he is a good christian and loving his neighbor better than himself and doing the work his hand finds to do with all his might that is a better church than most of those i entered where respectable saints have the best seats and there's no place for sinners said livy when she got home spurgeon's congregation preached more eloquently to me than he did the magdalen cried as if her heart was broken and i am sure those tears washed some of her sins away the feeble old man looked as if he had found a staff for his trembling hands to lay hold upon and the forlorn souls all about me for a time at least laid down their burdens and found rest and comfort in the father's house it did me more good than the preaching of all the bishops in london or the finest pageants in st paul's and i am truly glad i went though the saucy conductor did smirk at me over the rosebud in contrast to the serious expedition in contrast to the serious expedition the old lady had a very jolly one not long afterward a certain congenial professor asked her one day what person place or thing in london she most desired to see clasping her hands with the energy of deep emotion she replied the home of the immortal sari gap long ago i made a vow if ever i came to london i'd visit that spot let me keep my vow you shall responded the professor with a responsive adore which caused livy to dive into our waterproof without another word away they went in a pouring rain and what people thought of the damp but enthusiastic couple who pervaded the city that day i can't say i only know a merrier pair of pilgrims never visited those grimy shrines they met several old friends and passed several familiar spots by the way major bagstock and cousin fenix stared at them from a clubhouse window tig montague's cab dashed by them in regent street more gorgeous than ever the brothers cheerable went trotting cityward arm in arm with a smile and a halfpenny for all the beggars they met and the micawber family passed them in a bus going i suppose to accompany the blighted wilkins to go in a certain grimly genteel street they paused to stare up at a row of grimly respectable houses for though the name wasn't on any of the doors they were sure mr dombey still lived there a rough dog lay on one of the doorsteps and a curtain fluttered at an open upper window poor di was growling in his sleep and above there little paul was watching for the golden water on the wall while faithful florence sung to him and susan nipper put away derisive sniffs and winks in closets and behind doors for the benefit of them pit chances coming to a poorer part of the city they met tiny tim tapping along his little crutch past toby veck at a windy street corner and saw all the little tetterbees playing in the mud come down this street and take a glimpse at st giles the worst part of london said the professor and following livy saw misery enough in five minutes to make her heart ache for the day a policeman kept near them saying it wasn't safe to go far there alone vice poverty dirt and suffering reigned supreme within a stone's throw of one of the great thoroughfares made alastasia dangerous ground for respectable feet here too they saw familiar phantoms poor joe perpetually moving on and little oliver led by nancy with a shawl over her head and black eyes bill sykes lounging in a doorway looking more ruffianly than ever 
and the artful dodger who kept his eye on them as two hopeful plants with profitable pockets ready for him. They soon had enough of this and hurried on along High Holborn till they came to Kingsgate Street, so like the description that I am sure Dickens must have been there and taken notes. They knew the house in a moment. There were two dingy windows over the bird shop. The checkered curtains were drawn, but of course the bottomless fan boxes and window pippins, green umbrella, and a portrait of Miss Harris were all behind them. It seemed so real that they were quite expected to see a red, snuffy old face appear, and to hear a drowsy voice exclaim, "'Drat that bell! I'm coming! Don't tell me it's Mrs. Wilkins without even a pincushion prepared!' While Livy stood gazing in silent satisfaction, merely regretting that the name on the door was Pendergast and not Sweetlepipes, the professor turned to a woman and asked with admirable gravity, "'Can you tell me where Mrs. Gamp lives?' "'What's her business?' demanded the matron with interest. "'A nurse, ma'am. Is she a little fat woman?' "'Fat, decidedly, and old,' returned the professor, without a smile on his somewhat cherubic countenance. "'Well, she lives in number five round the corner.' On receiving this unexpected reply, they looked at one another in comic dismay, but would certainly have gone to number five and taken a look at the modern Sari if the woman hadn't called out as they moved on. I believe that nurse's name is Breton, not Garb, but you can ask. Murmuring a hasty thank you, they fled precipitately round the corner, and there enjoyed a glorious laugh under an umbrella to the great amazement of all beholders. Being on a Dickens pilgrimage, they went to Furnival's Inn, where he wrote Pickwick in a three-story room and read it to the old porter. The same old porter told them all about it, and quite reveled in the remembrance. It did one's heart good to see the stiff, dried-up old fellow thaw and glow with the recollection of the handsome young man who was kind to him long ago, before the world had found him out. "'Do you think the book would be famous when he read it to you in 1834, as you say?' asked the professor, beaming at him in a way that would have melted the heart of the stiff-tailed lion in the Northumberlands if he possessed such an organ. "'Oh, dear, yes, sir. I felt sure it would be summit good. Made me laugh so. He didn't think much of it, but I'll know a good thing when I see it.' And the old man gave an important nod, as if all the credit of the blessed Pickwick belonged to him. "'He married Miss Ogarth while living here, and you can see the room if you like.' he added with a burst of hospitality as the almighty sixpence touched his palm. Up they went over the worn stairs, and finding the door locked, solemnly touched the brass knob, read the name Ed Peck on the plate, and wiped their feet on a very dirty mat. It was ridiculous, of course, but hero worship is not the worst of modern follies, and when one's hero has won from the world some of its heartiest smiles and tears, one may be forgiven for a little sentiment in a dark entry. Next they went to Saracen's Head, where Mrs. Squeers stopped when in London. The odd old place looked as if it hadn't changed a particle. There was the wooden gallery outside, where the chambermaid stood to see the coach off, the archway under which poor Nicholas drove that cold morning, the office or bar, where the miserable little boys shivered while they took alternate sips out of one mug and bolted hunches of bread and butter as Squeers nagged them in private and talked to them like a father in public. Livy was tempted to bring away a little porter pot hanging outside the door as a trophy, but fearing Squeer's squint eye was upon them, she refrained and took a muddy pebble instead. They took a peep at the temple and its garden. The fountain was not playing, but it looked very pleasant nevertheless, and as they stood there, the sun came out, as if anxious that they should see it at its best. It was all very well to know that Shakespeare's Twelfth Night was played in Middle Temple Hall, that the York and Lancaster roses grew here, that Dr. Johnson lived number one inner temple lane, and that Goldsmith died number two brick court middle temple. These actual events and people seemed far less real than the scenes between Pendennis and Fanny, John Westlock and little Ruth Pinch. For their sakes, Livy went to see the place, and for their sakes, she still remembers the green spot in the heart of London, with the June sunshine falling on it as it fell that day. The pilgrimage ended with a breathless climb up the monument, whence they got a fine view of London, and better still of the Todgerses. Livy found the house by instinct, and saw Cherry Pecksniff, now a sharp-nosed old woman, sitting at the back window. A gaunt, anxious-looking lady in a massive bonnet crossed the yard with a basket in her hand, and the professor said at once, "'That's Mrs. Todgers, and the amount of gravy single gentlemen eat is still weighing heavy on her mind.' As if to make the thing quite perfect, 
they discovered fitful glimpses of a tousled-looking boy cleaning knives or boots in a cellar kitchen, and all the lawyers in London couldn't have argued them out of their firm belief that it was young Bailey undergoing his daily torment in company with the black beetles and the moldy bottles, that nothing might be wanted to finish off the rainy day ramble in an appropriate manner when Livy's companion asked what she'd have for lunch. She boldly replied, "'Wheel pie and a pot of porter.' As she was not fond of either, it was a sure proof of the sincerity of her regard for the persons who had made them immortal. They went into an eating house and ordered the lunch, finding themselves object of interest to the other guests. But, though a walking doormat in point of mud, and somewhat flushed and excited by the hustling, climbing, and adoring, it is certain that there wasn't a happier spinster in this pilgrim progess of a while than the one who partook of wheel pie in memory of sam weller and drank a modest quencher to the health of dick swiveller at the end of the delightful dickens day much might be written about the domestic pleasures of English people, but as the compiler of this interesting work believes in the sacredness of private life and has a holy horror of the dreadful people who outrage hospitality by basely reporting all they have seen and heard, she will practice what she preaches and firmly resist the temptation to describe the delights of country strolls with poets, cozy five o'clock teas in famous drawing rooms, and interviews with persons whose names are household words. This virtuous reticence leaves the best untold and brings the story of two of our travelers to a speedy end. Matilda decided to remain and study art, spending her days copying Turner at the National Gallery, and her evenings in the society of the eight agreeable gentlemen who adorned the house where she abode. Amanda hurried home with friends to enjoy a festive summer among the verdant plains of Cape Cod. With deep regret did her mates bid her adieu, and nothing but the certainty of soon embracing her again would have reconciled Livy to the parting, for in Amanda she had found that rare and precious treasure, a friend. Audio, my beloved granny, take care of your dear bones and come home soon, said Amanda in the little back entry, while her luggage was being precipitated downstairs. Heaven bless and keep you safe, my own possum. I shall not stay long, because I cannot possibly get on without you, moaned Livy, clinging to the departing treasure as Diogenes might have clung to his honest man, if he ever found him. For, with better luck than the old philosopher, Livy had searched long years for a friend to her mind and got one at last. Don't be sentimental, girls, said Matilda, with tears in her eyes as she hugged her Mandy and bore her to the cab. Rome and Raphael forever, cried Amanda as a cheerful parting salute. London and Turner, shouted Matilda with her answering war cry. Boston and Emerson, sobbed Lavinia, true to her idols even in the deepest woe. Then three damped pocket handkerchiefs waved wildly till the dingy cab with the dear Egyptian nose at the window and the little bath pan clattering frantically up aloft vanished round the corner, leaving a void behind that all Europe could not fill. A few weeks later, Libby followed, leaving Matt to enjoy the liberty with which American girls may be trusted when they have a purpose or a profession to keep them steady. And so ended the travels of the trio. Travels which had filled a year with valuable experiences, memorable days, and that culture which a larger knowledge of the world, our fellow men, and ourselves gives to the fortunate souls to whom this pleasure is permitted. One point was satisfactorily proved by the successful issue of this partnership, for, in spite of many prophecies to the contrary, three women, utterly unlike in every respect, had lived happily together for twelve long months, had traveled unprotected safely over land and sea, had experienced two revolutions, an earthquake, an eclipse, and a flood, yet met with no loss, no mishap, no quarrel, and no disappointment worth mentioning. With this triumphant statement as a moral to our tale, we would respectfully advise all timid sisters now lingering doubtfully on the shore to strap up their bundles in light marching order and push boldly off. They will need no protector for their own courage, no guide but their own good sense and Yankee wit, and no interpreter, if that woman's best gift, the tongue, has a little French polish on it. Dear Amanda's, Matilda's, and Lavinia's, why delay? Wait on no man, but take your little store and invest it in something far better than Paris finery, Geneva jewelry, or Roman relics. Bring home empty trunks, if you will, but heads full of new and larger ideas, hearts richer in the sympathy that makes the whole world kin, 
hands readier to help on the great work God gives humanity, and souls elevated by the wonders of art and the diviner miracles of nature. Leave on we and discontent, frivolity and feebleness among the ruins of the old world, and bring home to the new the grace, the culture, and the health which will make American women what now they just fail of being, the bravest, brightest, happiest, and handsomest women in the world. End of Chapter 6, London Recording by J.D. Gavin End of Shawstraps, A Second 